What's good, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast. I'm Andrea Renee, joined in studio by IGM's Alana Pierce. Hi. Hi. Thank you for having me. Thanks for coming by. No worries. It's going to be a great show. We've got Christine Steimer. Oh, hi. That's me. That's you. And Miss Brittany Brombacher. Hello. I'm going to try not to do bad accents. Alana, I apologize. I don't want to, like... <laughs> no, but I was British. It's fine. Them. It's more offensive that you apologized. <laughs> Especially because that was like a British accent and she's Australian. Right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, I don't I don't know what my accents are. No one's ever diagnosed what my accents are. So we'll see what they are. Your accent. Wait, you got a real funny piece of hair sticking out of your microphone. Or you're not your microphone. Your, your you do the side of your what head. What is that? The side what of your that? headphones. Just Oh, God. You should have just let keep it there. Continue. It would have been better. Um, well, welcome to the show. And I want welcome to the to show, everybody. Nightmare. This is Don't your place for video game <laughs> commentary analysis and clearly funny stuff. So uh, Britt has got something going on with her hair for everybody listening. It looks wonderful. If you would like to check it out, what it looks like, youtube.com slash what's good games. If you subscribe, you can check out our video cast, which we post there every single week. And we could also follow us at Twitter, what's good underscore games. And maybe if you're interested in checking out some exclusive content, you can head on over to patreon.com slash what's good games. Um, Alana, you have a Patreon as well. I do, but no one can spell it. So Well, you could spell it for us. Help us out. I don't even know how to spell it. It's just it's it's Charizard with my name in the middle of it, which is Char Alanazard. And which is amazing. Yeah, I post a lot of fun stuff on there. I really like Patreon. We were talking about this earlier, but the community there is so positive. It's a it's a really nice place to be a creator, I think. Especially if you do a lot of different stuff. It's a lot of fun. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And you also have a brand new podcast as well yeah i just started a podcast it's called red lips orange car and it is about how r-rated can we get right now well maybe we should save the r-rated stories <laughs> for the third segment okay <laughs> it's about misconnections listings on craigslist which get very weird and uncomfortable and you see some surprising stuff um but basically it's like about making backstories for the weirdest stuff we could find on craigslist it's a lot of fun we're going to talk more That's about awesome. that. I'm very excited to hear more about how this podcast came together. Uh, but you'll have to wait for the third segment for that because we have lots of news to get to this week, surprisingly, even though we are going to miss out on um, Nintendo's news, uh, which you guys will hear about by the time the podcast airs. But before we get to any of that, I need to tell you guys that we have a fantastic sponsor this week um this week's episode of what's good games is brought to you by ripped gamers so the thing with gaming is that we often spend a lot of time sitting around and that can mean that we don't end up as fit and healthy as we'd like which is obvious <laughs> for a lot of us <laughs> our friend tim ross over at ripped gamers was in the same boat himself and he got sick of feeling in worse shape than every ripped rpg character he played so he decided to do something about it Fast forward to today and he's lost over 40 pounds. He got a college degree in exercise prescription and helped dozens of others start their own weight loss journeys. Now, Tim is super passionate about gaming and wants to help other gamers around the world get healthy and feel better about their bodies. He's created a home-based, zero-equipment-required fitness program and nutrition strategy designed specifically for video gamers. And you can also join the Ripped Gamers Facebook community for advice, support, or just to meet some fitness-minded gamers. Now, if you're really serious, he even offers one-on-one, -on -one, entirely online coaching. Now, what's kind of crazy about everything over at Ripped Gamers is that it's completely free. The program, the Facebook group, even the one-on-one -on -one coaching. You don't need to put your email address in. You don't need to give your credit card number or anything. Tim is just out there to help people and Ripped Gamers is entirely nonprofit, which is awesome. So if you guys want to kickstart your fitness journey and get working towards your goals, head on over to Ripped Gamers. So that's R-I-P-P-E-D. G-A-M-E-R-S dot com and download your free program and join the community. Everything you need to lose weight is right at your fingertips and is 100% free. And I want to mention also that we've seen some awesome WGGers in the Facebook group for Ripped Gamers. And because some of them have brought some concerns about not having access to gym equipment and wanting stuff that was a little bit more beginner friendly, he's tweaked his program. So if you were maybe a little bit hesitant before, I definitely recommend you go over there and check it out. He's got a new program that's very very beginner friendly. And if you're like me and you hate going to the gym, and you only work out at home. He's got options for yep. you as well. So big thank you to Tim Ross and Ripped Gamers. That's awesome. Yeah, it's I great. lost 40 pounds like four or five years ago. Wait, really? Yeah. 
It was like I lost a lot of weight and it like completely changed my life. Like, and I, you know, I've been a gamer my whole life and that was part of it was that I in part blame Halo for it was that I just like <laughs> after I graduated school, just like didn't do any exercise, played a lot of Halo and gained a ton of weight. And then, yeah, ended up losing it. And it took like maybe six months to lose that amount of weight. But uh, like I slept better. I could walk up a staircase without puffing. Like I wasn't as stressed in general. Like it completely changed my life. And I like fully recommend it. It's also if you're already a gamer working out is is almost fun because you can set things like an achievement goal you're like oh i'm getting the xp from doing this and that's how i approached almost everything so definitely that's amazing sounds cool congrats thank you let's all get fit together yeah it'll be great (laughs) i went to berries this morning Woo! (laughs) and now i'm drinking wine and i didn't work out today whoops tomorrow neither i'm gonna work out tomorrow it's gonna happen it happens um, but let's go ahead and get to the news. As I mentioned, there was a lot of stuff that happened this week. The first story on the docket, Xbox exclusive State of Decay 2 finally has a release date. It's coming out on May 22nd, just a couple of months away. Over on Xbox Wire, they wrote a statement saying, when we first set out to create State of Decay 2, we knew we wanted a true sequel that took everything fans loved from the first State of Decay and created a more dangerous and unpredictable world that allows players to engage with one another in co-op multiplayer to survive. We've been diligently working to deliver our, our vision, and today we're happy to announce that we'll launch on Xbox One and Windows 10 PC as an Xbox Play Anywhere and Xbox Game Pass title on May 22nd. And then they go into some details about the standard edition and the ultimate edition and some DLC packs, which you guys can look up on their website. That said, it's crazy to me. This is $30. Yes. That's insane to me. $29.99, I would have expected it to be way more expensive because it's marketed like a full release. Like the first one was arcade only. It was summer of arcade, winter of arcade in Australia, fun fact. Uh, (laughs) And so it was like a completely different title and I was expecting this to be a $60 release and I don't know what to make of the fact that it's $30. Like, does that mean that the quality is less? Does that mean that they're... Microtransactions. That was kind of my thought. Loot boxes, it's a (laughs) games of service thing. Like, is it because of Game Pass that they're making it cheaper? Like, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, I think we're going to have to wait and see how Game Pass works with some of their Mm -hmm. AAA titles. Like, they've mentioned Gears of War and Halo as being part of Game Pass. Sea of Thieves. I think they said Crackdown would be day one Game Pass as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's pretty crazy. It's super crazy. I am very excited. I love me some zombies. Alana, are you a zombie fan or are you burned out? No, I was for a bit. I'm totally not now, though. It's been a while, you know. And State of Decay... I, the co-op aspect is what I'm really interested in. Like with two, it seems like it's all about resource management, but with friends. So a lot of like coordinating what you're doing and it's going to be fun. Like for Xbox sp- specifically going straight from playing sea of thieves into this, it's like, maybe I can have the same crew for both of them. It'll be a lot of fun. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, Brittany, I know that you love zombies. I'm not particularly jazzed about this. Cause I'm very much like over zombies and video mm-hmm. games, but you played a lot of the first State of Decay, right, Brett? No, I never played State oh, of Decay. Oh, not at all. Because it, because it didn't have multiplayer. And the, the resource management, survival kind of thing is something I can only play with another person. Otherwise, I'll just kind of burn out. Now, I know State of Decay had a story, but it just it just didn't appeal to me enough to like get into that whole resource management and look at all get all the survivors and do all the buildings and all the things. So uh, now that this has multiplayer, I'm very much looking forward to playing this with you ladies. <laughs> Right, Andrea? You're going to play this with me? You're going to play a zombie game with me? Right, Andrea? Sure, of course I will. Britt, you know I love you. I will play. I will give it a go with you. But here's the thing. you got to actually invite me to play. Oh, this is never going to end. I'm just saying it'll end once you actually send me, like, a party invite and be like, let's play. Getting called out. I've played with Andrea a bunch. I don't know that I've ever played anything with you, Brittany, and we talk about it all the time. <laughs> uh, you and I played that zombie game, that zombie warrior game, like many years ago. Don't start with me, Christine Steimer. Zombie Christine warrior Steimer game. Alive. I don't know. It was the side scroller beat 'em up. It, it was a forgettable game. I don't remember it what it was. It was a forgettable oh, game. Shit. I do remember this. Yeah, yeah. Oh, what was that game? I don't remember. But I'm very much <laughs> looking forward to this. I love me some zombies. And like my dream zombie game has always been one where you are just thrown into this world and you have to do like resource stuff and there's a story and you have to survive. And I want to be there from like the beginning of the outbreak to the end of the outbreak, obviously when everything gets nuked and everyone dies. Um, <laughs> but like that's something I've always wanted. And I that feel like that is how the zombie stay... apocalypse ends. <laughs> yes. Besides, besides Dying Light, I don't feel like a game has been able to deliver that, but I think State of Decay 2 could get really close. So I'm very excited. Ha. Huh. Plus, it's the day after my birthday. Happy 30th to me, man. 
That's awesome. Oh, I didn't know you were turning Ex- the big 3-0 this year. Yeah. We're going to have to oh, plan man. something extra special for when you come into town. Because we found out last year when we launched What's Good Games in May that Steimer, Britt, and Alexa Ray all have May birthdays. Oh, no. Well, oh, yes. Oh, yeah. That could be good. Yeah. It was good yeah. but bad at the same time. Yes. Bad because then I have to do three gifts at once. <laughs> Instead of or, one or, at time. We can just do a What's Good Games live from Las Vegas. <laughs> oh my gosh, this is genius. We could do a pool party. It'd be great. Oh, yes. Even though all of the internet everywhere in Las Vegas is terrible because they don't want you to be on the internet. They want you to be at the tables or at the bar. <laughs> God, I hate that place. <laughs> so they intentionally have bad Wi-Fi everywhere? This is my theory. I don't know. You're if probably right. True. Yeah, yeah, that's probably true. Because yeah. they've got, they could easily have. Because every time I'm there for internet. a conference and I'm trying to send video files, I can't buy my way into premium mm-hmm. internet. Oh, it's, it's like, like 10 grand a gigabyte. Like, it's yeah. insane. <laughs> so dumb. Yeah. You must hit the jackpot and jackpot in order to actually have good Wi-Fi here. Yeah. Good fucking luck. Um, I do <laughs> want to mention one thing before we move on to the next story. Um, they are going to have cross-platform co-op, which Ooh. is uh, takes the fact that it's multiplayer even one step further. Mm-hmm. So that way, if you have people who are playing on PC, they can play cross-platform with Xbox One, which is awesome. That's really nice. Not enough games do that these days. Yeah. yeah, see if Thieves is doing the same thing. I think Xbox is like, they don't get enough credit. Like, sure, they're, they're objectively on enough exclusives. They don't get enough credit for the services they have. Like, the fact that you can jump into Sea of Thieves and that's part of the actual Xbox dashboard and that was the insider program was something that everyone had presented to them as part of their UI is so cool. Stuff like this, like the Play Anywhere program means that you have a game on both platforms. Like, I think that stuff is really cool and I, I wish that people would, like, applaud them for it more often. But they, Agreed. They do definitely need more games also, so... They're so, working like on you it, were saying, supposedly. The, the standard edition is $29.99, and the ultimate edition will be $49.99 to get early access. I think that's May 18th, so three days early, and then it, or four days early, and then additional content. So for I think it also oh, includes State of Decay 1. I think you get the first game with that extra edition oh, as well. Oh, okay. interesting. Yeah. That's a deal. And you get the Independence Pack and the Daybreak Pack, which are two pieces of DLC. It's cool. All right. All I right. mean, I imagine you can buy that DLC separately. So it's just yeah. kind of like buy yeah. now or buy so. it later, right? Yeah. Why would, or why would they not take the opportunity deal. to sell something to you when they can? Right. <laughs> I mean. All right. Well, that's enough talk of State of Decay 2. Well, let's move on to Monster Hunter World, the thing that I have an unhealthy obsession with right now. <laughs> <laughs> Never saw this coming. <laughs> yeah. I didn't either. I feel like we've said no. that every week now that I talk about Monster Hunter. But they've got some really exciting news that they announced this week. Capcom has now shared that Monster Hunter World has become the fastest selling game in the publisher's history. It shipped more than 7.5 million units when combining digital sales and units sent to retailers, but not necessarily sold through to consumers Mm -hmm. yet. But I have no doubt that they'll hit that number before the end of the year at the very least, if not before summer. So it's worth noting, according to GameSpot, that this comparing this milestone is based on its list of all time best sellers. However, that list does not always combine sales for all versions of a single game. For example, resident evil five is listed as Capcom's best selling game ever. As of December, 2017 with 7.3 million sold. However, combining its release on last gen and current gen platforms, as well as its gold edition, resident evil five sales have reached upwards of 10.6 million and resident evil six. Similarly appears to stand at 8.4 million total. So like, I don't want to like get buried in the semantics of Capcom's press release. I think the takeaway here is that it's doing extraordinarily well, better than any monster hunter title Mm -hmm. has ever done. And one of the best that Capcom has ever done in its history of making games, which says a lot because they've been making games for decades. And this is awesome. I'm really like, I want to say I'm surprised because when I originally heard about the, you know, release of monster hunter, world i wasn't i wasn't that like jazzed about it at all i was like oh well it's out in january so it's coming to ps4 and xbox so i guess i'll play because previously like i didn't have that great of an experience playing it on 3ds and previously was really only available on what psp yeah and 3ds or ds yeah that's the thing is to me monster hunter goes hand in hand with nintendo 
them doing this well, does that mean that it's never going to be on a Nintendo console again? Like, I think that that's pretty surprising and, and it almost seems like a failing on Nintendo's part. But I think the January thing is also a huge thing. There was nothing else out in January this year. Like, I've played a ton of it and I really enjoy it too. But it's like, that had to have helped it so much. If it came out in November, it's like, no oh, way. Yeah, well. Oh, yeah, would have gotten Oh, yeah, nobody would have. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, I think that you touch on a good point about it never being a Nintendo exclusive again. But there are a lot of calls from fans in the community for them to port it to mm -hmm. Switch because it would be such a fun game to have on Switch. I just don't know if Nintendo's network capabilities are robust enough to handle it because clearly like, they're struggling with network issues mm -hmm. on PS4 and Xbox one so, so and the text is tiny how would you see it on that tiny screen it's like it's already like i have to be like wait what does that say let me get my glasses zoom in you just do what the pinch that? zoom yeah but people are playing skyrim <laughs> on, on on switch and they're those menus are small that's and, true and, and things that's too true. but um i thought they said they weren't going to didn't they not already confirm they're not looking at a switch port i thought somebody had been tweeting us at, about that yeah so they said that they are not currently working on it but adam boys of iron galaxy who has worked on many ports over the years iron galaxy has a lot of a lot of behind the scenes stuff that a lot of us don't know about like they've worked on specific sections of bigger games um they had he came forward and made a very popular tweet about Hey, Capcom, yeah. if you need someone to help you port games to the Switch, because they worked on the Skyrim Switch with Bethesda. So oh, cool. Yeah, he tweeted and was like, this is literally what we do. Let us do it. It's like, maybe they'll I, consider it now. I think mm. last time I checked, it had like 1.5 thousand tweets, like retweets, which is pretty good. Yeah, not uh, bad. I feel like this is like the Monster Hunter fans have been asking for for many a year. Um, I know it's been on the Wii, and I think even the Wii U. But I tried getting into it on 3DS and on the Wii on the Wii U. But the truth is, like, Nintendo's hardware just isn't powerful enough to, to really do the series justice, like PS4 and Xbox One, obviously. So I think it's fantastic. Like you said, I want to say I'm surprised, but I'm not. It, it, like, for years, Capcom, hey, bring us this. I don't know about it. And they do. And then blammo goes the awesome hammer. But like you also have no to blammo <laughs> goes the awesome <laughs> hammer. It's so big in Japan is the thing. Oh, like, yeah. It's the biggest game ever over there. There's so many PlayStations over there. Like, it would get guess that the majority of people who bought it have bought it on PlayStation. That would be an interesting stat to see. But it's just like it makes sense to me that it blew up over there for sure. It's, oh, yeah. it's huge. Whenever I do matchmaking, almost all of the people that matchmake into my sessions when I send up SOS flares are all speaking in Japanese mm. which is like I'm like they're like sending me messages I'm like I can't read what you're saying but thanks <laughs> like, for helping me take you. down the engine app <laughs> <laughs> anyway so are you are you still playing it a lot Andrea like I know we'll get into this in the hands-on section but yes I mean yes yeah. I am I was up until 3 a.m all three nights this weekend playing Monster Girl. Hunter World because now I'm doing the high rank stuff and I've unlocked uh, unlocked i've met like some new monsters that are pretty gnarly and i know Did that they've sent out a teaser about the monster that's coming in the mm -hmm. uh, spring update but yeah they're essentially just like hybrid versions of some of the monsters that we've already seen but i'm finally to like a new area which is nice because not that i don't like hanging out in the wild spire waste but <laughs> <laughs> you, you know you kind of you they've reused a lot of a lot of areas but that being said, and I don't want to get too into the weeds of it here, but the level design in that game is fantastic. I don't remember the name of it. The area that looks like it's uh, underwater. The Coral Highlands. Yeah, that's it. I love it there. It's so pretty. Like even just walking around, they're always like, oh, incredible. It's just like coral everywhere. It's so nice. Yeah, it's awesome. Okay. Um, so congrats, Capcom. Um, looking forward to seeing how big that number is going to get when you finally launch on PC, which is scheduled for later this year. All right, next story. Jurassic World Alive is essentially Pokemon Go, but with dinosaurs. So this comes from Polygon. That's what the little <laughs> DNA guy in the movie says. He says dinosaurs. <laughs> the monster hunting of Pokemon Go meets dinosaurs in Jurassic World Alive, a new augmented reality location-based game for Android and iOS coming this spring. Developed by Ludia, which has previously worked on Jurassic World, the game and Jurassic Park Builder, Jurassic World Alive will let players track, collect, and do battle with dinosaurs. Jurassic World Alive puts players in the role of a new recruit in the Dinosaur Protection Group. <laughs> this sounds weird. I'm, I'm sorry. The dinosaur Protection Group. <laughs> players are tasked with saving did dinosaurs. They witness a crime? Wait, what was that, Steimer? I said, did they witness a crime? 
Someone's <laughs> got to protect them. Probably. Um, so you're tasked with saving dinosaurs from another extinction by tracking them, collecting DNA samples, and creating new hybrid species in a lab. Those man-made dinos can be assembled into a team and fight in player versus player arena battles, which kind of seems counterproductive to the whole dinosaur protection thing. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, my God. <laughs> Thank you. In a press release, Universal and Ludia said players will track the Jurassic prey with a drone and must track down supply drops in-game to earn in-game currency and battery life for that drone. Um. Okay, so um, <laughs> some screenshots have come up of this game, and it looks literally exactly yeah. like Pokemon Go. Like, they just ripped the art assets from Pokemon Go and then put mini dinosaurs in it. Put cartoon dinosaurs in there? Yeah. It's funny that they thought this would work, because I feel like they, they didn't realize the success of Pokemon Go is because everyone knows the original 150 Pokemon. If you don't have an attachment to, like, whatever kind of dinosaur, it doesn't mean as much. Like, I don't think this is going to work anywhere near... They're like, we have this genius idea. Let's make a Pokemon Go clone, but it's dinosaurs. And people are going to be like, eh. Oh, my God. I want a raptor. Good. Sword. It's a Velociraptor and a yeah. T-Rex. And then yeah, you can like breed the them. Dinosaurs I can name. <laughs> you know, so you so yeah, you collect the DNA and then you can make, turn them into hybrids. So I mean, it's it's just like as well, Alexa would say, cuckoo bananas, a pterodactyl, a T Rex. Yes, girl. Happens. Yes. <laughs> I'm trying to think of a name for that, like a pterodactyrex, <laughs> a <laughs> rexodactyl. <laughs> yes. That could work. Um, I, so I just Googled this because I was curious because I know like there's so many Pokemon now. I was like, how many there's dinosaurs? 740 could there Pokemon be? or something like that? There's over 700 different species of dinosaurs oh. in case you didn't. Okay, they basically are Pokemon. Pokemon. I guess so. so. Yeah, exactly. They basically are Pokemon. But, but Is I mean, there a know, trash like, bag dinosaur not... though? That's what we need Yeah, what about know. that key one? <laughs> just a series of keys. <laughs> Oh, God. <laughs> I'm sure they have some garbage dinosaurs, too. <laughs> garbage dinosaurs. Sandcastle dinosaur? Ice, it's going to happen. Ice cream dinosaurs. Yeah, creepy possessed <laughs> sandcastle dinosaur that will steal your soul. <laughs> don't go to that beach. No, <laughs> don't, indeed. So I, I'm with you, Alana. I don't think this is going to have near the success of Pokemon Go, mostly because I think a lot of people are kind of like over it the initial mm-hmm. like fervor of the get out and go to the park and meet people at the gym yeah it was that thing. two weeks and then everyone was like mm-hmm. yeah there's still quite a few people playing yeah but not i don't think that as many people are going to be as excited for for this i wish that in the art assets that they released it felt a little bit more jurassic park e mm. um and i know obviously the augmented reality part is that they have to use their existing surroundings but it just looks so identical to Pokemon Go in a way that's so obvious that I'm kind of like, eh, you guys yeah. didn't even try. Yeah. So, also, I, mean, I this hope is not you're paying on Niantic a, like, a, like a licensing fee or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Zephyly is not the last IP we see trying to copy that formula, for sure. But, oh, yeah. well, uh, you know, I'm going to play it. Why not? I'm pretty but- excited about whatever the Harry Potter game that Niantic is working on is going to be. Yeah. Like, th- that sounds like... I don't know. I I can't even picture what it's going to be like. I can't picture a Harry Potter game in the Pokemon Go AR format like this game looks, but it sounds cool, whatever it is. It's probably going to be like the, like you catch magical creatures. I I think, and you're supposed to be able to cast spells against other people. Like there is PVP in this one, I think. Avada Kedavra. (laughs) You smutted someone on the street. It's crazy. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) All these people are dropping dead. It's really weird. (laughs) At least Jurassic World Alive has PVP battles. Pokemon Go still does not have that yet. I I don't understand what the hell they're waiting for. They only have raids now, right? Yeah, and kind of the gyms. They wanted it to be friendly, and I get that, but that's also lame. But that's not what... It's Pokemon not Pokemon. Is. But that's that's the staple Battle Pokemon. You gotta other. you gotta catch them all. Your heart's so true. You know what I mean? Yeah, your courage teach me will teach pull you. us through. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then you you battle them, and then that's what you do. They get stronger, and then you're friends after. I don't what the hell. Anyway, <laughs> and then you let them go because you're Ash catch them, and you're the worst Pokemon. Yeah. yeah, yeah. You catch all your Pokemon, then you release them. Idiot. While crying. <laughs> I thought that was a creepy Independence really Day. Sad. <sighs> I have no idea what you're talking about. There's an episode where he lets his Butterfree go free, and it's the saddest oh, yeah. thing ever. It's so upsetting. He's just, Butterfree why did you was do a, that? Butterfree had raging hormones. He, it was a huge... But, okay, Andrea, let me set the scene for you. You're on a cliff. There's like a Butterfree orgy in the sky. All the Butterfrees yeah. what's are mating. A, what's a Butterfree? It's a, oh, basically it's, a giant butterfly yeah. Pokemon. Right. And then uh, Butterfree, Ash's Butterfree, they're all called Butterfrees, sees a beautiful pink Butterfree 
fluttering in the wind. And Butterfree's like, oh my god, my hormones, I must mate with this. And then he, Ash is like, go on with your bad self, and Butterfree goes, and that's it. Ash Butterfree's is gone. not cock block Butterfree. No. Butterfree is free man. to go. I think that's the same episode man. where you see a dragonite in the distance that's like a million times bigger than a lighthouse, and you're like, hold up, what? <laughs> this just oh, changed yeah, like, everything like I ever knew. Like he, it I, looks like Godzilla, right? I fought like, that dude in the Elite Four. Was it that big when he had two Dragonites? Like, what happened here? It's insane. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, yeah. have you ever seen an episode of Pokemon? No. What? Oh, God. Not a single one. No. Oh, my God. Oh, no. I've never watched any have anime. You watch them. Unless you watch them. Any? Unless you count The Last Airbender. Nope. Oh. You've never seen a Ghibli movie? No. What? Yeah. Why? I, I, I don't know. I'm not interested. No one's ever been like, okay. you must sit down and watch anime. You definitely need to watch a Ghibli movie. I've heard I've, people have been like, at the very least, I need to watch Cowboy Bebop because it's like a supposed to be like a gold standard of anime yeah. or whatever. But I'm like, Fair. I don't know. Alexa Ray has tried to get me to watch her puppet show, though. Thunderbolt <laughs> Fantasy. Oh, her creepy. Uh, <laughs> what is that? <laughs> so it's a Japanese oh. drama. Would you call it action drama? And it's all uh, like puppets, like hand oh. moved. Like think Sesame Street, but like anime Sesame Street. <laughs> and way creepier. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So there's like fan service and stuff in there. I, it, I've never watched it. I, yeah. yeah, that's a good question. Do the puppets get naked? I don't think so. Okay. I don't think so. I, I don't no, no. think. So. Yeah, I don't think so. Okay, not, well. Hmm. That's my <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> like so, how okay. it stumped everyone. Like, maybe. <laughs> maybe. I hope not uh, because they're made of cloth and things like that. Like they're normal puppets like wood and cloth and plastic. Like getting naked would be awkward. I mean, there's weirder things on the Internet. Yeah. I'm sure, you know. Very yeah. true. Uh, okay, so Andrea, we're going to watch some Pokemon. Uh, next time I'm over there. Okay. I watch movies. I saw Labyrinth. I saw what else was it that you showed me? The Secret of My Success. The Secret of My Success. Thanks. One of my favorite '80s movies of all time. All right. Brace Simon yourself fell asleep. She was like, "I'm bored." Michael J. Fox. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> Brett hung in there with me while I was like geeking out. I wasn't out. bored. I was fucking tired. I had to go to work the next day. <laughs> <laughs> that's fair, so this is just, this is, midnight that's way past my bedtime <laughs> so the thing ladies and gentlemen is i don't i haven't seen a lot of classic films a lot of the the iconic staples of the film whatever and so people throughout my life have always tried to show me new and not new but exciting films that you know mean a lot or meant a lot at the time whatever and so they're sh- they show me labyrinth they show me another one there's another uh, oh what's the what, hocus pocus i had never seen yeah, that before you ladies movie. Yep. So Andrea, it's my turn to teach you the ways of the Pokemon okay. next time. The thing I'm open is, to it. Pokemon is probably still good if you've seen it because you have nostalgia for it. I'm worried that you're going to realize that it's terrible. Uh oh. <laughs> yeah. Because like I can watch it and be like, Oh, this is great. Childhood me loved this and you're gonna be like, None of this makes any sense. Why is he so whiny? Like it's just not I don't think it's gonna work and I'm sad for you. Thank he is you. kind of a shitty character. Yeah, he but... sucks, dude. I'll just drink yeah. a lot, I yes. guess. <laughs> yeah. Good, yeah. yes, yes. Drunk, we the best. <laughs> and more looking forward to Andrea's reactions, honestly, because yeah. I agree. I just rewatched the the first season, like, maybe a couple months ago, and I loved every minute of it. But, yeah, if, if you've it's never seen it, you're going to be like, entirely. what is this dinosaur with a red flame coming off of his tail, and why is he on a rock oh, or a stump in the, so in the so rain? It's so sad. Yeah. Okay, well. I, I, Andrea calls that a Charmander, Alana. Pretty cute. Listen, I, I learned the, the lesson. It's char, like char broil. Got it. <laughs> char Charmander. Charmander. <laughs> Charmander. Whatever. Cher is spelled with a C at the beginning. <laughs> Champagne. You have points. You, the saying it that way is not invalid. Thank I get you. it. <laughs> Pokemon names sense. are hard. I okay? do like your 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 reference is champagne. You're like, I mean, <laughs> champagne, <laughs> Charmander. Come on, champagne and show, and then Charmander. Oh god. All right. Now that we've completely gone off track for what we were talking about, um, Oculus Rifts, they've stopped working. Uh, they might be working by the time this show airs, but at the time of taping the show, Oculus Rifts around the globe not functioning. Um, so the original story, which came from IGN News, um, Oculus Rift devices around the world stopped working due to an error notifying users their devices were unable to reach the Oculus runtime service. In a post on Twitter, Oculus acknowledged the issue and said it's currently working on a fix. We're aware of the issue impacting people's ability to use the Rift software. 
Many users have reported the issue on the Oculus forums, saying they're getting an error message. Can't reach Oculus runtime service. Your Oculus software may be updating. Please wait a minute and try again. And so what they've discovered is that ripped headsets are no longer usable, which is kind of a problem for a piece of hardware. Just, just a little bit. Um, they received an, this story got an update saying Oculus has confirmed that rifts around the world are still not working due to an expired software certification. The company is working to resolve the issue. Their official statement is, hey, everyone, this is an issue with our software certification that we're still actively working on. For security, we use a certificate to ensure that the software you receive actually comes from Oculus. That certificate has expired, and we're looking for a few different ways to resolve the issue. We'll update you with the latest info as available. We recommend you wait until we provide an official fix. Thanks for your patience. This is like somebody either quit and never told anybody that this was a thing <laughs> and just, like, peaced out. <laughs> They'll figure it out one day. Like, I hope that that's what happened. How? There's... A so fix go ahead, right Britt. now. Uh, yeah, there's a temporary fix, and this is from Twitter at chaos with a zero and 95. Chaos is 95. And he or she said, if anyone is wanting to play as of now, if you turn your real time off and change the date on your PC to March 1st and then restart your PC, this will allow you to play. Hope it helps. Enjoy. Also, my is door it? in my bedroom just opened. That's fine. I'm sure That's it's great. Your is your dog no. here? No, he's not in here. It's not oh. Reb. Is Reb is Reb invisible? Is he wearing he's an invisibility too. cloak? <gasps> yes. That's... Sorry, I'm fine. Maybe just... Harry Potter's at your house. <laughs> I, I played a lot of paranormal VR like a few hours ago, so I'm a little paranoid right now. Anyway, so the... <laughs> one of the main issues with this is a lot. Of... Oculus waited far too long to issue a statement, and people by by the time Oculus issued this their statement people had already uninstalled reinstalled which is like not a quick thing to do and people are changing like their time on their pcs and so people are really upset that um and understandably so that they waited so long to issue the statement not a good look it's Bad news bears. it's also funny that then when they do issue it they do it with hey guys <laughs> like oh, what? Hey, hey, he's gonna hey, address uh, everyone uh, that way <laughs> but i think it's you know, this isn't that different to like PSN going down. It's just that the hardware is so different that we treat it kind of differently. It's like you can't use any of it unless it's online, which, right? Well, this, yeah, you have to authenticate the certificate, and that sucks. But it's like it's just because it's you know something we put on our faces that we're like this is unacceptable. Like it's it's different if it's a if it's PSN or Xbox Live, which is which is super interesting. But it's also something about the idea of. VR headsets all around the world malfunctioning at the same time is horrifying, especially <laughs> when they're funded by Facebook. It's just like, ooh, what's going to happen here? Like, is there going to be, like, at some point some error message that just gives everyone a seizure? Like, what? Like, <laughs> I hadn't even thought about this stuff until now. Oh, my gosh. And I own an Oculus. That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah. I, the thing that's egregious to me is that both Facebook and Oculus are two of the most advanced technology companies in the world. The fact that they had their certificate expire and nobody on their team saw that coming is like, what? What are you guys doing over there? You That's what I was the saying wheel? about. Like, I think someone just like a few people probably just quit and like never told anybody <laughs> that this was a thing. They were like, yeah. deuces, I'm out. They're like, peace out, Girl Scout. Oh no, the certificate guy left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I guess never mind. <laughs> Hopefully by the time this show airs yes. on Friday, they've gotten it sorted out because if it's still not fixed, wow, that'll be three days then yeah. that Oculus have been down. But um, we'll uh, <laughs> we'll give you guys an update if uh, anything exciting happens. But hopefully they resolve the issue tomorrow, which will be Thursday, and then Friday when you hear this show, you'll, you're maybe listening to us while you're playing on your Oculus. Probably not, but you know. You can Probably make it work not. if you wanted. It's true. Why not? Good. Um, I wanted to talk really quickly before we end the news segment um, about the cool stuff that Far Cry announced for this week. So you guys know Far Cry 5 is happening in just a couple of weeks. We're all very excited for it. There's going to be a dog. His name is Boomer. He's so cute. Um, but they announced some more details. Oh, they showed some more details about the season pass, which was previously announced at the beginning of February. And now we know that it's getting an arcade mode. So over on the UB blog, they wrote, Far Cry Arcade is Far Cry 5's map editor mode. It's bigger, more versatile, and more packed with content than it's been at any point in the series past. The first Far Cry map editor 
to enable players to create their own solo co-op and PvP levels, Far Cry Arcade is a chance for players to crack open the game and use its assets to build their own customized adventures and experiences. Far Cry Arcade's goal is to make these custom maps as accessible as the campaign. And one way to accomplish that is to integrate them directly into Hope County and your character's progression. Walk up to an arcade machine in a bar, for example, and you can jump straight into the Far Cry Arcade. Check out the latest user-created levels, which will be curated by the developers, and start playing. You'll visit these worlds as the same custom deputy you play in the campaign and experience points, perks, and money or money you earn while playing will cross over into the campaign when you're done, which is awesome. Mm. And no, that doesn't mean you can just create a level filled with cash and make yourself. <laughs> <laughs> so Are you is, sure? I'm sure someone's going to figure that out. Well, I mean, yeah, if anyone is going to figure out exploits in a game, it's going to be somebody who's digging into the assets and making user created levels. Right. But this is really great that they're um, making this more robust. This is a very nice added value because this is just included with the game. It's not part of the season pass, but the season pass sounds really cool. They detailed four different little standalone pieces of content that are coming. There's a, a, a one set in Vietnam that made me think of Tropic Thunder. Mm -hmm. There's one that is set on Mars, which made me think of Total Recall. <laughs> um, there's another one that's set in the zombies. And then there's something else. That I'm Zambies. 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 Yeah. Oh, um, the and the zombie one's interesting, right? Because there's a director and he has certain like ideas or inspirations and you have to act those out or something in the form of zombie waves. I may have just butchered all of that, but it's something like that. Which is cool. It all sounds Zombies. really cool. I think the, the coolest thing about yeah. Far Cry Arcade is that it's like Halo Forge, but you can put any Ubisoft character in it. So it's like I can have like a million assassins fighting someone from Far Cry fighting a Yeti. Like that sounds so cool. So good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm really excited to see what people do with it because I love playing people's creations, mm -hmm. but I'm not creative in that way. Um, I just like like seeing what other people come up with. And if anything that we've seen, you know, from previous iterations of this, even if you look at the Minecraft community and all the yeah. crazy stuff that's being made over there, like people have some really wacky and weird ideas up their sleeves. Yeah, I always think people are just so much more impressive than me because I can never do that. But Dreams is a game that I really want to start getting into that stuff with. Whenever that comes out, I really want to make cool stuff in Dreams. Like I'm quite invested in that. That game seems so cool. <sighs> this is probably a thing where wait. I'll just be like, hey, yeah, let me check out this... 100 v 100 yeti battle that someone made i guess like it's gonna be fun it's gonna be super weird yeah i mean that's another game that we don't have a release date for uh we did get a mm -hmm. release date i don't know if we talked about this on the show last week that detroit become human has a release mm. date um it's may, may 25th yeah that sounds right I think. may is the best month let me double check i <laughs> believe it's may um, I was hoping it would just come up here in the Google you just search. say immediately? It's it's definitely May. I just don't remember what... Uh, Google failed day. us. They did. Oh, Google. Yes, May 25th. Yep. Um, yeah. So we, I think we missed that in last week's show, but mm -hmm. so now so we have too. release dates for God of War and release dates for Detroit Become Human. Still nothing on Spider-Man, still nothing on Dreams, but Dreams looked but like when we saw it last, it looked like it was pretty close to being done. At PSX, they said to me that it'll come out literally as soon as it's ready. So... <laughs> That could well. mean at any point. This isn't like a they're thing like, that they're we've like. We've been waiting so long in this game. We've been sitting on it. We just as soon as it's done, we gotta push it out. <laughs> it's like not a thing that they're holding to a release date. I think it's like okay, it's done. Let's release it. And I, I think that's kind of how it'll happen. But we just don't know when that is. It's like, and I think Spider Man's probably gonna end up being. It'll totally be just sometime after E3. Like I would guess maybe August for that. And then there's still the Sony Days Gone. Death Stranding's coming five years from now. Yeah, that's not right. <laughs> yeah, and then The Last of Us, it'll probably be next year. I don't know. It should be interesting. I would guess The Last of Us Part Two is coming fall 2019. Yep. Around holiday. I would, I'm would. i thinking Spider-Man's... If it's not making a surprise appearance in June, which I, I'm starting to think is unlikely, I'd say maybe September. Yeah, August, September makes sense to me. And then um, Days Gone, like early next year, like February next year. Yeah, completely agree. And then we'll probably have some new announcements from them at E3 as well. So they have like a pretty packed out release schedule. So, yeah. yeah. They have dates gone at PSX. I don't remember seeing. They had like the photo yeah, they opportunity. They had like a photo op, but they yeah. didn't show anything well, it's new. not a no. thing. Like that makes me wonder how that game's doing. I think this it's still pretty far away. We're going to slow down. We're never <laughs> going to have free time. There's so many games coming out. Yeah. Last uh, year was like that too. But that's like one interesting thing is uh, Crackdown was supposed to be. 
Oh my God, Crackdown. Spring? Just give it to me already. The, I don't think that game's going to come before June. I just don't see it. It's, it was supposed to be I spring. I feel like we would have heard right. by now. Right. No one's played it except for that one game's come like three years ago. So it's like, it's got to be <laughs> different. It's got to be delayed again. I played it, it at E3. Be. You played it at this year's E3? Correct. How was oh, it? Yeah, this year's right. E3? Oh, was that the multiplayer thing? No, it was just Crackdown. Really? Just ran around. I did not play it. Was that, it was at the, um, gosh, where the Galen Center. Is that what it is? Yeah. Yeah, oh. yeah. Microsoft had their event there where That's they had right. a bunch of games. The yeah. showcase, yeah. The showcase, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm kind of going back to the Far Cry arcade. Um, I played RPG Maker a lot growing up, and I back then the tools like were not easy to try to make your game. It was really clunky. But I, I appreciate, you know, we were talking about this earlier. How I feel like. I mean, this is the only other game I can think of besides Dreams. But I think it's interesting and good that they're implementing this in because I think this could also be a really good gateway for people who have that creative spark to kind of test the waters and how they might do in like level design or game design or something like that. It's and funny I'm excited you to say play creative people spark because the last one was exactly. Project Spark, <laughs> that uh, Xbox exclusive. Oh my God. That no yeah. one really oh caught God. on to. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, you're totally right. This is like four people who make that stuff and then haven't had anything in the meantime. And like, I just think Dreams, like the art style of that I'm so sold on. And I think I'll actually try that one. And it sounds like a lot of other people will. Whereas Far Cry Arcade, I think will more be entertaining. Like, you know, like some of the stuff that got made in Halo's Forge ended up as real game modes, like Infection and uh, Griff Ball is the other one that like they made into real modes. Like I could never make one of those. Like there's no way I could do that. <laughs> I'm never going to do something that cool ever. Yeah, don't sell yourself short. Yeah. I think I believe in you. You, you can make can the do next it. Griff Ball. Yeah. You can do it. Yeah. <laughs> Just, you know, get drunk because then your confidence like goes up a little bit yeah. and you're good to go. Yeah. <laughs> Liquid courage, everybody. All right. Liquid so courage. before we um before we break, um, I just wanted to touch quickly on a couple of things that were rumors that aren't really enough for us to talk about as full stories. Um, Diablo three maybe is coming to the switch. Blizzard came out with um, a, a very uh, ambiguous teaser on Twitter with the light switch and the Diablo figure. And then they said, no, 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 we're not making Diablo three for switch. And then Eurogamer said, no, our sources say they definitely are making Diablo three for switch. So we don't know. We have no confirmation, but Hey, we can all cross our fingers and hope that one day Diablo that will come to switch. Um, awesome. Nintendo fixed that playtime glitch. They're working on a fix. I should say it's not implemented yet, but they realized people were mad that at the year anniversary of the switch, that their playtime got erased. Nintendo was like, oopsies are bad. We're fixing it. Don't worry. Your playtime's not erased. So don't Woo-hoo. sweat that. It's come is going a fix is on the way. Plus, um, Trump supposedly president Trump is meeting with the electronic software association. Maybe that ha- meeting actually happened. Maybe it didn't. Maybe they talked about video game violence being a thing, and, and hopefully they didn't because that debate's been settled. When PBS makes a story saying, didn't we settle the debate about violence in video games, then maybe the president could also settle that debate. I, I mean, Andrew, we all know video games are only available in the United States. Come true. on. Like, Very this true. is the only place where you can play video games. Yeah, so uh, it makes Alana never sense. got to play video games when she lived in Australia. No. No, it's crazy no, that I got a job at IGN uh, as a video game journalist when I could never play them before I moved here. Yeah. Funny it's how amazing. that works. Yeah. Um, so we don't know if what happened there, but hopefully, hopefully it was uneventful for all of our sakes. And then <laughs> lastly, a Nintendo Direct happened. Um, uh, maybe something big happened. Maybe it didn't. Maybe they released or, or talked about how there's going to be a new Super Smash on Switch. Or maybe they talked about Pokemon. Or maybe oh. they talked about, I, I don't know, a variety of other things. Who knows? Uh, the, the big rumors are the Fire Emblem, the Eulogy of the Brave, Pokken DLC, premium DLC for Super Mario Odyssey, which could be uh, rumored Luigi's Mansion. Oh. let's Yeah. Travis Strikes Again featuring co-op, Bayonetta 3 stuff, South Park coming to Switch. You know, so we'll see. I, uh, I mean, the only thing that my, was confirmed was Mario Tennis. Yeah. 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 Mario. Yeah. They're talking about like release dates and whatnot for that tomorrow i i don't really care I about hope we that see but Fire Emblem. Yeah, this is gonna I, be weird you know. for anyone listening on friday though they're all like "Ooh, <laughs> <That's> <laughs> <true. What? laughs> uh, so we'll probably we'll cover if, if it's big news we'll probably cover it in next week's show um so apologies that we missed it because of when this when the uh, direct is happening but that's going to do it for the first segment we're going to take a short break when we come back We're going to be talking about some games we've been playing, including Florence. 
and Moss and probably more Persona 5. <laughs> Stay with us, everybody. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is the Voice Good Games podcast, in case you forgot. Um, <laughs> you probably didn't forget. I, I don't know why I say that. Some weird transitional need of mine to make some kind of a bridge between the segments. Um, it worked. This is the hands-on segment of the show where we talk about what we have been playing. And for once, we've all played the same thing. That's amazing. Oh, my God. That rarely ever happens. Um, so you guys have probably heard about a little game called Florence. So Anna Pura and Annapurna <laughs> Interactive <laughs> is the publisher in Mountain Games, which is a collective of a few independent game developers, created this little masterpiece that is currently available on iOS and is coming soon to Android. Um, I think it would also play really well on Switch, but maybe mm -hmm. it's too short of an experience to publish on Switch. I'm not sure, but um, this game is wonderful and it's hard to really pinpoint why it's so wonderful so before we continue collectively do we want to talk about everything that happens it's such a short game it's kind of hard to talk about it without really spoiling what happens in the game let's spoil the shit yeah, out of it let's just spoil it. <laughs> so here's what we're gonna do we're gonna allow people who want to experience florence uh, for yourself, without it being spoiled, um, you probably want to skip ahead about 10 to 15 minutes, let's say. Um, uh, so you could just pause the podcast and go play it real quick because it's not that long. That's true. Like 40 it's minutes. Actually, yeah. I literally is. finished it while we were setting up the podcast. That's true. So. It's probably, yeah, if you go quick, probably. I think it was like 20. 20, yeah. 25. Yeah. Oh, yeah. If you take your time kind of like listening to music or kind of really examining the art, you could stretch it to like 35 or 40 minutes yeah. maybe. But um, it's short experience, so um, and it's only two ninety nine, so mm -hmm. super cheap. So yeah, that's a good idea. Pause, go play it, come back. We're gonna talk about mm -hmm. it. Okay, you've been warned. So Florence, when I first picked this game up, I did not anticipate it being as emotional as it was. Did anybody else feel that way? I expected For it a little bit. I expected something because people had been talking about it on the Twitters. I expected some sort of emotion. However, the emotions did not grab me until like the final like chapter or the final scene. But we get to the that final later. scene. The really? Final... It took that long? Yeah. Um, it took me that long because at that moment, it was when she was when Florence was clear. I'm jumping ahead. Uh, it was when Florence cleared her debt, was clearing her desk, right? Mm -hmm. To go pursue her own passions and hopes and dreams and whatnot. At that moment, it clicked with me of like, holy shit, this is, this has been a, like my life. Like not exactly, but you know, um, forming a relationship like it, when I was younger and having a passion and not really exploring that passion until that relationship had ended. And I did have that moment where I cleared off my desk at my day job and pursued my dream and my passion. And it was at that moment, I was not expecting it. I just started like the tears started falling. The dam had was broken <laughs> at that point. And I was like, dang, like it wasn't that I was super sad. It wasn't that I was angry or anything like that. It was just a, no other game has, has ever done that to me before. It was like, it resonated with me so well that it caused me to cry. It was strange. It was a very beautiful moment, though. But I am jumping ahead. No, I think, I mean, it's, so, it's okay to jump ahead. I, I agree that it was, there are certain moments that were very poignant. And every time another moment came, I didn't think that I would, it would continue. It felt like every act of that game had its, like, very emotional moment. From, like, like smiles and, like, the kind of, like, reminiscing of that time you like first fell in love with someone or first had a connection with another person in the in a romantic way which we kind of see in the beginning to like the um, kind of awkwardness of like the first kiss and then the the one of the fun parts of the of the game that I really liked was uh, when you when when Florence and Krish move in together this idea of like you're combining your your items and so you had to like pick mm -hmm. and choose which things to keep and which things to leave behind and i thought that that was like a really fun little mechanic the way that they incorporated gameplay yeah throughout the experience because it's hard to really call it a game more of like a very interactive story but it has really good mechanics mm -hmm. um like the thing that made me the most sad weirdly enough was 
um, there's a photo of you with two friends when you're like seven years old or whatever, or in oh, Florence, yeah. I always say you, uh, and you have to move the, the clock around and it shows them pulling apart. And it's like, well, I was physically doing that, you know, because I was moving it and I was the one pulling them apart. Like, I think that mechanic was really powerful. And I think the part you're talking about is the same because you made the choices of what to take out. And then it has, after he moves out, you see the empty spaces. And it's like, because you did that, it feels more impactful. So I feel like in that sense, it totally is a game, even if the story is the same, no matter what. But I think if it weren't, it would mean less ultimately. If it was a comic, you wouldn't be as affected by it as you are because you have to interact with it basically. Absolutely. Yeah, I would- my favorite part was the um, when you're talking with him, especially at the very beginning, like the puzzles are a little bit more intricate and you're like, cause you're like not sure what to say maybe, or you're second guessing yourself. And then as you become more comfortable, the, it gets way easier and it's just basically two pieces you're putting together. Um, I thought that was really clever. I liked the way they did that. Yeah, the did two rounded pieces. Sorry. And, oh no, you're fine. And then uh, as you argue that, the pieces become jagged and really sharp. And I thought that was brilliant. So good. There's a lot of stuff um, you can infer just based on the way that things look. And I think you're right. The dialogue was a really good example of that. And even the the, the puzzle that took me the longest is the putting them together to see that they're hugging. But the way that it's like constantly pulling apart, that being part of the puzzle is it's like, it's really hard for that moment to happen for them. And it's also like supposed to be hard for you as for the same reason. It's like, it's difficult to like give this hug and, and say goodbye for the last time. Like, it's crazy. They did a really good job. That puzzle took me like 10 minutes. Yeah. I was like, why isn't this working? And you're drifting too fast. Too I know, it's like, this is turning into a Picasso. What is going on? It's just things are moving around. Yeah, and, and I co- think... Go ahead. No, and the colors were also like really muted mm-hmm. in that particular puzzle versus other parts of the game where some of the colors were very vivid and the music was very vibrant. And I think that was clearly them communicating the tone of where the story had gone. Mm-hmm. And I love how when you are moving, what's his name, Krish? Mm-hmm. Krish. Krish. Yeah. And, um, you know, I spent a lot of time also like, okay, what's like a fair compromise here? Because I don't know if this game's going to judge me and what I kept and what I threw away into storage. Like, is this a Bioware game Wait, where so they're going to punish what me? what do you keep, what do you get rid of? <laughs> like, do we break up if I don't take any of this stuff, if I throw it yeah. all in storage? <laughs> so I tried real hard to make it like a 50-50 thing. And then in the end, for you to ultimately, inevitably break up, it... And that's something that's super powerful about this game is I feel it's real. Like this is something that I've experienced moving in with a boyfriend and, you know, everything's hunky dory and super happy. And you have to say like, okay, what do we keep? What do we put into storage? And then you spend all that, obviously, because you did do this within like a few minutes of, you know, moving into breaking up, depending on how quickly you played, you feel that impact a lot more. It's like, I spent so much time like trying to make sure this was like an even split and everything went well just for him to all to move out in the end. Like what a waste of time, you know? And, uh, <laughs> just I mean, like right. every relationship. Right, but oh I no, like- Steimer. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> Relax. There's that salt. But I thought that was really impactful. Also the fact that it wasn't a happy ending, you know, in the sense that, for Crush and um, Florence, Florence. Uh, you know, when she has done her thing and she has her paint, her art gallery, I expected Krish to be there, you know, and, and to them be like, oh, hey, congratulations, you did the thing here. Like, I'm here happy, we are live happy, happily, happily ever after. But that didn't happen. And again, that's real life. I feel like every teenager needs to play this game. It's not always going to work out well for you. But in the yeah. end, you'll be fine. But like you'll be okay. Yeah, exactly. you'll be fine in the end. Right. I think what was interesting, Britt, that you just touched on when you were like, I was trying to make it an even split and like make sure that he was happy in this thing. Um, I think I like that they like it doesn't ultimately matter because as I've talked about before on this uh, podcast, games have sort of ruined me and like if I do all the right things, this relationship will work. Like right, like if I just like if I hit the buttons in the right way or if I say the right thing at the the right right time, like he will love me or this will work and everything will be happy. Like it's not really how it works. works. Yeah. Right. It definitely seemed uh, like at least a little bit uh, inspired by La La Land. Like even that ending is like there's two people who had these separate passions they pursued together, but ultimately only succeeded after they broke up. And I feel like, like I wouldn't be surprised if it was inspired by that. Cause there's like a huge parallel there, but that's the thing I think is interesting. And I wasn't sure if this game would resonate with me that well. And I don't think it did as much as other people, a, because of the, the setting in which I played it, but also because I'm 24, I haven't had that relationship. And like, I felt the same way with La La Land. Like I haven't had, like I've been with my boyfriend now for over two years, but it's like, I haven't been in the relationship where I've like, thought that it wouldn't end or that I 
moved in with someone and then had to move out. So it's, it's weirder for me. Whereas I feel like this is something for people who are like closer to 30 have been through that relationship and therefore it means way, way more to them. And I think that's probably a, a, a different circumstances. I don't relate to it that well because I've just only had crappy teenage relationships that I knew would end mostly. So <laughs> I was like, hmm, that's I, sad. Hope you're okay. <laughs> no, I, I'm glad though that you haven't had that that sad experience, uh, because moving in with somebody and then having to go through the awkwardness of one party moving out is it's it's really hard. Yeah, and I think that they did a very good job, particularly through use of music in this game of conveying the different emotions from like the, that initial flirtation and that fun, happy feeling that you get when you first start falling for someone to like the really like connected feeling you have. Like once you've made the commitment to each other and you're like, I love being with you and I want to be with you. The thing that was really poignant to me was in the beginning, how they were snuggling in bed together. And then when you got to like the routine, how they were separated in bed and how like, real that like hit mm -hmm. home for for me and like a past relationship that i'd had oh and the one part that was like visually just really good was you're trying to put pieces together and it's the two of them laying in bed and you keep and you i kept trying to put it together and like trying to connect yeah. the two of them and then i was like oh wait i can't connect them at this point like the puzzle pieces don't let the two of them actually overlap it's like damn dude that's yeah. so deep well and you're like done. oh there's it's supposed to go like this yeah wait it doesn't fit yeah yeah. It's crazy. I remember that. <laughs> Good times. <laughs> Good times when you're like, oh, shit, this is really broken. <laughs> I think that this is a, a perfect poster child for what mobile games can be. And clearly, they're not the first to make a really impactful, powerful, well-done mobile title. There are many of them out there, but... So many people are so quick to toss mobile games into this pile of like, oh, it's just a mobile game. Oh, I've, you know, it's like, you know, I played on my phone. It doesn't mean that it's going to be good. And I think that or I hope that, you know, people will look at a experience like this and give mobile games, you know, the time of day that I think they so rightly deserve because there's a lot of really great work being done in that space. And it's a device that we all can play on. Like we're never going to be separated into console wars with mobile because like everyone's the got a Android phone in their pocket. Yeah, I was about to say uh, Android slash iOS. Yeah, but it's coming <laughs> up for both. But um, my point, my point is though that you have one or the other, right? Like Windows phones don't exist anymore. So, <laughs> R.I.P. Oh no! It's and it's also I hope Anna Pono is the studio to lead that. You know, with like Edith Finch and then Donut County. Like they've made a lot of really good games like this, and I would love to see them just come out with like Anna Pono Mobile Studios and keep making stuff like this because they do such a good job of quite short contained stories that are just very emotive and yeah i i enjoyed that a whole lot and, and to your point like all i have on me when i was sitting here while you were setting stuff up was my phone so like i can't just play a 30 minute xbox game right now you know like it's it's right there it's so accessible it's something that everyone can play and you're totally right like you have the time when you're in a train or whatever that you can do that kind of stuff so absolutely cool. any um okay. parting thoughts ladies on florence the music's real good it's really good it's it's just so brilliant. Like we were talking about the way the gameplay is implemented and the color and the music, you know, it, it, for me, like when we are fight, when you have the arguments and like I said earlier, you know, when you're getting to know each other, the, the court, the edges are super rounded and cute. And then when you're arguing, they're sharp and pointy, like that's so smart. And it's not until I was like a few seconds into that gameplay that I'm like, ah, oh, this is what they're going for. And it makes total sense. I just loved it so much. Did anyone else during the argument parts feel I felt competitive. Like I wanted to be doing it faster. Yep, like, no. same. Like I want to, yeah. So I thought that was really interesting the way that they managed to get you to feel that. Of like, no, 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 no. I'm going to win this. Even though you're no, well, you know, it's funny you say that because I actually was like, oh no, no. Cause I am not a fan. Obviously no one's a fan of arguing, but I'm a fan of communication and communicating healthy. And I know just yelling and trying to win an argument, it just hurts both parties in the end. So I actually like stopped placing the puzzle pieces in the bubble. And then what happens is uh, when he's like spit firing arguments at you, the screen kind of tilts a little bit. So it looks like he's kind of in power. And then he took over the argument and I was, hmm. I was like, Oh no, I wonder if it ends faster. If you just don't fill in any bubbles. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. Really it's, good. I think at that point when you're both filling in bubbles, it probably does that intentionally because I, I, I if I remember correctly from an hour ago, uh, <laughs> it does show him also filling them in, in the arguments. 
So yeah, it like probably it does. does that intentionally so that you're like, hang on, I need to do this faster. Whereas with the cute bubbles, he just says something and then you're like, oh, what am I going to say back? Oh. And you're like, oh, he, he, you're yeah. so cute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, when you're arguing too, that speaks to real life as well. I think so many people get caught up in the, in the act of arguing. It becomes a, a competition at that point. And that's what it was portraying is, you know, you see your partner like filling in these bubbles and spitfiring these arguments at you. And then you feel compelled to do the same because you automatically get defensive. That's human nature. Yeah. So that it was really interesting how they did that. Loved it. So good. So good. Yeah. Play Go this get teenagers. It. Buy it, everybody. It's only Play three it. bucks. It's less mm-hmm. than a coffee at Starbucks these days. You can afford it. <laughs> True. Um, uh, so another game that um, most of us have been playing is a lovely little title called Moss on the PlayStation VR. So I want to make a disclosure before we talk about this game that um, not only does my husband work at PlayStation and worked on this title, but um, Link Davis is one of our awesome What's Good Games Patreon producers. So they do support us. So if you want to take our opinions on the game with a grain of salt, you are welcome to do so. So I just want to make sure we get Not me, and there. I think it's terrible. No, I'm kidding. I also think it's great. <laughs> Alana has absolutely no affiliation with either of, those two, um, <laughs> either of those two entities. So I just wanted to put that out there first. But that being said, dang, is this game cute. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's also very smart. So the thing that like really impresses me about it is it has those two really distinct control schemes. You have when you're the spirit, I guess. The reader. Yeah. And so that's the, the motion control system. But then when you're actually controlling Moss being the little mouse character, then you have to use your joysticks. And it's like thinking between those two separate things. I'm like, oh, wait. This is the part where I'm the spirit. This is the part where I'm the mouse. And I like, I love the way puzzle solving feels when you have these two completely separate control schemes that you have to deal with. And I, I think it's really smart. Also, the combat's actually pretty fun. Yeah, I, I agree. So for people who aren't familiar with what this title is, it's an adventure game set in a forest-like uh, it kind of feels a little medieval. You see at some point swords and like these helms that harken very much to like knights fighting. Um, you play this little mouse character who is so adorable. Her name, of course, is... Um, Quill. Yes. Quill. Um, her yes. name is yeah. not Quill. Moss. No. It's Quill. <laughs> Correct. It's the book of Moss is, is the kind of the overworld that you're living in. And so her name is Quill and she's got a little sword and she's trying to be a hero. And you control her, as Alana said, through her locomotion through using the dual shock. And then you use the kind of the six axis controls and the gyroscope within the dual shock to move other parts within the world. So you don't use the move controllers, unlike a lot of other PSVR games. And I actually prefer that. I like being able to sit in a chair and I have to stand <laughs> and move around. Um, but I, one of the things that I kept going back to that I had to keep reminding myself when I was doing these puzzles was I was like, you can lean forward. And yeah get a, and get a better look like if there was like certain corners that i was having trouble moving around i was like you can look around the corner which is something <laughs> you forget and which is why it makes it such an immersive vr experience from a, a puzzle perspective because it al- almost reminded me a little bit of captain toad treasure tracker in the sense of how in order to move in the puzzles in that world you have to rotate it but instead of rotating it with the camera controls within the game you're literally moving your head around the object to see where the openings are and that's a thing that i think like it makes you feel like it's probably one of the first psvr games where i felt like i was a character rather than just being a camera which i think does make it more immersive because you're like oh i am this guiding spirit the the reader and it doesn't make you feel like you're just like an arbitrary camera that's just like weirdly ever up in everyone's business like i think that's really cool absolutely it's also very pretty and uh the scale is really impressive too i think absolutely brit yes you you finished it i did no spoilers but like you're farther along than I'm only about, I'm only about like 90 minutes in, but it's only about yeah. a four hour game, right? Yeah. Like four hours. There's really not a heck of a lot. I could spoil, but obviously besides the ending, the story, what happens, but I mean, the gameplay remains the same throughout what I, what I love about VR is I love this idea of being transported to a virtual world, right? Like fantasy world where I can look around, look behind me and appreciate the intricate level design. And Polyarch did such a great job with this. 
you know, there were times where I would like stand up on my couch and like lean way forward to try to see like, okay, but what's behind that like wall right there. And then sure as shit, there was some, something there, you know, some sort of detail. And I love that so much. It took me a while to warm up to Moss. Um, because when I play VR, I like to do experiences, um, not so much like hardcore gameplay, so which is why I, I ultimately loved Moss. But I like to do like the first person, the Walking Sims, the horror games. Like I watched um, Restless Spirit. I watched a movie on my VR just like a few hours ago, and it's about this. This is Japanese film where this girl tries to like come and kill you. Like that's the kind of stuff I love in VR. Um, or just in life I- in general. <laughs> <laughs> Japanese yeah. girls coming to kill me. Yeah, it's great. It's good times. <laughs> um, and so, and, and so. Puzzly p- puzzle games, platformer games, they really don't like float my boat that much. Um, but this one eventually obviously captured my attention and I really learned to love it. I think all the issues I had with Moss wasn't because of the game itself. I think it was because of where VR is right now in its life cycle. Look, one of the problems I had is you don't really know like where you're necessarily supposed to be looking when you're looking at a VR level because technically you can look from any perspective and see some really cool stuff. And so I would be sitting there and I had a, a like my my setup isn't ideal. So I have a huge my, where my PS4 Pro is and the VR setup is. I have like 15 feet from the um, end table to where all the systems are to the couch. And that's because I have like a 118 inch projector. So obviously like the couches are way far back in that room. And unfortunately the PS camera, the cord isn't long enough. So it can't detect me when I'm sitting that far away. So I had to rig up some crazy like setup with a suitcase so I can place my PSVR camera on (laughs) it. Or you could just move a chair into the room when you're playing PSVR, which is what I did. That's a good point. (laughs) That might, so be, I tried that, that might be easier next time, Britt. <laughs> okay, but I don't have any chairs that are tall enough, and that was why I used the suitcase. I don't Maybe it's the couches I have. Maybe they're abnormally tall. What I don't about know like what a dining room chair, like a chair that's your dining room table? I Do I need know. to I... Amazon you a folding chair? <laughs> oh, my so, God. No, that would have been easier, but that means I would have, had, have hauled a huge-ass dining room chair upstairs when I had a suitcase that was just in the next room. <laughs> I'm lazy. Anyway, so the problem I had was like – Fair angling the camera at me and like making sure I could see my headset and my controller and that the control is constantly being seen by the infrared and all that good stuff. Um, there were times when I would try it cause in this game you can assume the control of enemies and make them do your bidding. And I would try Very to use, yeah, <laughs> nice. I would try to use my dual shock to like grab them, but the tracking would keep getting disconnected or, um, and so that was more of like a position angle, a position issue on my end. But what I was getting at, and I completely went off the rails, is that the problem is like half the time I would be looking at a level from the wrong direction, and it wasn't until I had to cons- I had to consistently reposition um, by holding the um, options button or the sh- yeah the options button, which automatically like retracts your system, which works really well. Uh, but I think that's just because VR is so early that there's no like perfect way to know like if you're looking at a level from the right direction or not. Because oftentimes it- I would resync and it'd be like, oh, that's easy. But I had spent like 10 minutes trying to figure out a puzzle because I had never seen the switch to begin with because it was like hidden behind some nook. That's interesting because I never ran into that issue. And I don't know if that's just the way that I had my PSVR calibrated. But this is the problem that a lot of people have with virtual reality is that it is very intensive. I had to watch the IGN video of how to set up your PSVR with with John Ryan, who's amazing, um, about like how to plug everything in again because it's been so long. And when I pulled the kit out, I like looked at the box and all of the cables and everything, and I was like, I don't remember how to set any of this up. And it took me a while to figure it out, but I mean, that's like the barrier and why yeah. people don't casually play VR. They either are in it all the way and are big enthusiasts and are mad that their Oculus is bricked or <laughs> or they're like me and they pull it out every once in a blue moon because they've heard good things about a, a game with a cute mouse character. Well, that's what I was going to say is like, the, I, I didn't have any of those issues playing Moss either. I haven't finished it. Uh, I probably played about the same amount as you have, but I didn't have any issues. But that is why I like Oculus the most with VR is that I find the setup incredibly easy. Like it's just put my two cameras in place having to play the stupid demo game every time is infuriating whenever you have to set it up it's like put the cassette tape in the it's just like this stupid vr game but aside from that i think it's really simple to set up and i have had those issues with psvr and that's why i'm expecting like a psvr 2 to solve that and that's when 
in theory, even more mainstream audiences will jump in. But I mean, so many people already own VR that it's PSVR that it's 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 sold super well. But over two million units now, yeah. It still is does unfortunately depend on the environment that you're in, like one hundred percent. And you know, hopefully we can get past that. The CES announcements this year with wireless VR, like they're really moving towards that. So I think I think we'll get there. Just not quite yet. And Moss will still be yeah. good when we get there is the thing. It's like, yeah. you know, you could play that again with PSVR 2 whenever that exists and it will still be a great game. So The thing that really yeah. kept me in the game and normally I my, my threshold for VR is like 20 minutes and I'm like, I'm out. And the reason I was able to keep playing this game is because the puzzles are so eloquently designed and the positioning of the camera has a lot to do with that. So many times in VR games that I've played you are moving the camera with your with your in first person mm-hmm. and i get so queasy so quickly in vr that i loved how when you got to the puzzle scenes like the camera was stationary there were places where you could you know lean in to look but it's not like you're having to constantly rotate the camera around or it's not like fallout or skyrim in vr where you're like teleporting Ugh. all over the world <laughs> And when Moss is moving around, the camera is in a fixed position and you're just moving Moss with, excuse me, Quill uh, within the world. And I like that because it makes me feel more grounded and I don't get the motion sickness that I've gotten in previous VR I get titles. really bad motion sickness as well. And my favorite VR game is Kronos, which is made by Gunfire oh, yeah. Games. Who are oh, that was Dark excellent Side as well. Yeah. Right. And it's like an eight hour game, like potentially more depending on how you play it. But the, the camera's fixed the whole time, like Resident Evil. So you just have to look left and right. And I think it still gives you that really cool VR sense. Like people who haven't played it are like, well, why is it in VR? Because the scale is still really cool. And you're like, you know, you feel like you're in the front row when you're fighting a demon and you're seeing it up close. Or if there's an environment that's really tall and you're looking up at it, it just means so much more in VR. And mm-hmm. I think I prefer fixed camera for that reason. Like there've been some games I've had to review or that I've had to write a preview of or something that I have to take breaks. Uh, Minecraft on Vive was one of the worst that... It, I would just get really, really hot and feel like I was going to throw up and I just had to take it off and then breathe for a few minutes and then put it back on again because it can be, movement is just so hard to do because we still have that motion sickness thing, which I think is a testament to how well VR works that it tricks your brain into thinking you're moving when you're not. Like that's super cool that it manages to do that effectively, but it, it is crippling for people who get that motion sickness. And if the developers don't get the frame rate right, yeah. I mean, that's a huge thing that a lot of people overlook. And like, obviously there's a, there's a core community of people who play both on console and PC who frame rate means everything. Clearly we're still having these 30 versus 60 debates constantly versus unlocked. But like in VR in particular, it's so important for developers to get that right because otherwise the speed at which your brain is trying to reconcile what you're seeing with what you're feeling, like it, like the, the, the imbalance there, you get to it much quicker than you would on a 2D mm-hmm. image. But yeah, like when we were playing, what was it, Firewall? Firewall, yes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was like, God, I feel like I'm moving so slowly. But then... I was like, but if I moved any faster, I would probably want to throw up. Yeah. And so that was that sort of weird balance where I was like, all right, I guess I'll give him a pass. I mean, <laughs> this is super slow Rainbow Six. Yeah, I think <laughs> it's important to like if you're going to do VR, you have to learn how to VR. It's almost like kind of like learning a new platform. It's, well, it sounds like you ladies didn't have the issues that I had, but I learned that if I like lean into my PlayStation camera and I sync the headset at that point, it'll give me a far away view which made it easier for me to see the entirety of the level design. Now, Grant, like I said, I had a wonky ass set up with a goddamn suitcase, so I, I probably wasn't <laughs> ideal. But not everyone has a perfect setup for that. Um, also, you know, you have to adjust the headset up, down, left, right, so you can see clearly. But even then, it's not going to be super clear. You're not going to get these high-def graphics that you're so accustomed to. So you have to learn that you can't, like, I shift left to right and expect everything to be clear and crisp. And... Uh, that's something that took a while for me to, to relearn because I used to do a lot of VR, but it's been probably like a year since I've really done it. Um, so if you're going to do VR, be patient. And I've said this before, you can kind of, I for me anyway, I was able to build up my tolerance and now I can do Moss. Um, you know, I did like two hours at a time with Moss. I can do the games where you walk in the line and you turn fluidly and I don't get sick. It took a while to get there, but also take a shot of alcohol beforehand. That always helps me. <laughs> It'll go. just make you dizzy from the get-go. And then, then you won't know <laughs> the difference. Exactly. <laughs> you won't know you're sick because you're just sick already. It's fine. Yep. <laughs> um, have any of you read the Redwall series? No. Nay. Oh, never mind. Well, I was going to ask if you, because like the one 
Moss is the only VR game where I'm like, I am interested in playing this because it hits that like nostalgia button of these old books, this old book series that I read called the Redwall series. Um, there was like Moss Flower, and there was obviously one called Redwall. Um, but it's basically like it was little mice. Like it was this whole story about these mice and castles and shit. It's been a long time since I read them, but um, I saw as soon as I saw the the trailer for Moss, I was like, <gasps> no, it, and she like is that. so adorable. The way that they've animated her, like the locomotion of her character as she moves through the level, is just so cute. From like the way that she like struggles to pull up on ledges, and when she does like uh, spins, it's like the like the butt on the ground like spin move. It's so cute. She just is like, and the way her ears like wobble around. I mean, Quill is she's one of the most adorable video game characters I've ever seen. They did a fantastic really job with her animation. I say it's a, it's a good reason to get VR. Like if you're gonna if you're like I need a game to play VR in, like this is the game. Mm-hmm. This is like what you should play. It's really cute, and you do really bond with this character, this little mouse, and she's so fragile and weak, but she's so strong willed. Yeah, I loved her. Really cute. I have my quill statue in my bedroom right oh, now. Those are so good. Oh, so cute. Yeah, so if you guys are on the fence, if you own PSVR and you're on the fence of getting it, I highly recommend it. It's a lot of fun. The puzzles are really well done. Uh, they're very interactive. And, um, you know, like we said, like, it's it's a good time. Check it out. Um, Steimer, you're still not finished with Persona 5. <laughs> I don't know that I'll ever finish this game. <laughs> it just feels I'm not like either. I'm not even. Okay, so which uh, which section are you on? The uh, seasons? I just what are they? Finished the fourth palace, um, which like, I don't even what, want to say the character. Part of the year is that I don't remember. It's I'm on uh, a break. You're on a break. Yes, <laughs> so I'm like Octoberish. Yeah. Towards the end of the year, I'm past the point in the game where the hot detective boy kept walking up to me at a train station and telling me he was sweaty. <laughs> which is really weird. It was just so like every hot. time I saw a catchy for like several weeks, he was just like, "Man, I'm sweaty today." I'd be like, "What the hell? I don't even know." You. Like, <laughs> stop doing this. I so I don't think it's summer anymore. Well, I barely know and tell them how much I'm sweating. <laughs> it's very strange. Yeah, no, I'm. I'm. So I had tweeted. Granted, the, my phrasing was slightly incorrect. Um, I had tweeted how I had gotten the uh, quote unquote bad ending of Persona Five. Really, what it was was I had a game over. <laughs> <laughs> like, oh, it wasn't. It wasn't a, a true ending. It was one of like so. Persona games have um, towards the end of them several instances where you can kind of really fuck it up. I hit the first bump of that road and really <laughs> screwed it up. Got a game over and went. Oh damn! And it was funny because the game really tried to steer me out of it. <laughs> it was basically like it's beating really... me over the head. Like, what are you doing, you dumbass? We're telling <laughs> yeah, you not to do this. And I you did it anyway. Tried, yeah, you tried real hard, Simer, to get that game over. <laughs> I I felt really stupid when it hit. I was like, oh, yeah, okay. It and then you texted me. I did text you. I texted you a bunch. Um, it legitimately said, are you sure? <laughs> are you sure this is the right decision? Uh, obviously, I'm being very vague because I don't want to spoil anything. Yeah. But, um, and I was like, yes! Well, just really committed to it. I Next time a game ever asks you if you're really sure, just go back and rethink everything. I accidentally started dating on, and I'm I still, accidentally started dating her. Too. I'm pretty sad about it because how I you, how, I reloaded. Easy to do. I thought about reloading, but I hadn't saved for ages, so I was like, I guess I'm just gonna date her. Like, fine, I guess. Like, I just wanted to be friends, but whatever. We're dating I now. I followed the Goldfarb rule of like save almost every other day. Yeah, I, I save every time I can. Sometimes it takes a really long time. I think it was like I'd got, gotten stuck in one of those loops where it's just like, and you just keep going forever. It was like, yeah. a, like an hour. But uh, no, I, I want, and I'm still working on dating Takami, the hot uh, nurse. Oh, the hot doctor. Hot doctor. Oh, yeah. Hot doctor. yeah, yeah. She, the, the hot goth doctor. She's my favorite. Um, And I think I'm like level nine with her right now. But then I started dating on and I was like, well, now I feel bad because I'm going to have to cheat on talk of me and i don't want that and it's just like well, i guess i just gotta do it <laughs> like there's yeah, no way for me to break up with on so i'm here now i guess yeah, you yeah. Are. i i 
texted Brit. I said, oh, no, I think I romanced on. This was after I already got the game over screen. I was like, why am I fucking everything up? Got to reload. This is just my life. Like, Because <laughs> like, I'm going for Makoto. Right. Because I love her. I think she's wonderful. I think she's, she's probably the canon person you're supposed to date. Badass. Like, yeah. Motorcycle armor, which I dig. Yeah. She's yeah. smart. I like that. So how long have you been playing Persona 5, Alana? Well, I accidentally left it on once, so it tells me 80 hours. I <laughs> think I've probably played about 40. Um, That's a long time to leave it on. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I think I just left my PlayStation <laughs> on and like took a flight or something and came back and was like, oh, whoops. Oh, shit. At least it's fine. <laughs> it seems to be okay. It's just like the, the hours are way high. I could be up to 50 now, I guess. But uh, yeah, I've been playing it in terms of months. I started in, I think, November? Maybe December. Yeah, it would have been, like, late in December. So I've been playing for, like, a long span of time because I feel like I'm playing it in seasons. Like, I do a palace, and then I take a break, and then I do a palace. So, like, I haven't played in three weeks. So it's, like, I just keep consuming it that way. But I like that you can do that, especially when it's a long game. I don't feel like I'm being punished for, like, having a time where I ease off and then jump back in again. So right now I'm at the point where... I've done everything in the palace that I needed to, and I'm just waiting for the person to, like, react. I'm just waiting for, like, the countdown time to end. So I'm just, like, going to the cinema and doing the burger challenge and reading books. Get that charm up. Get yeah. all those stats up. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So when I, when I played Persona 5, I could not stop playing Persona 5. Like, that was my life for a very long time. So is there a reason why you ladies, like, don't power through it? It's because you're busy with other... Sam, I know your, your backlog is, like, from hell. But, like, a lot of you specifically... Can it, does it not just hold your interest or are you so wrapped up with other obligations like other games and stuff that no, you just can't it totally holds my interest in that it is a game that when I am playing it I can't put it down and I totally get that it's just that I travel so much so it's like sure. literally that I have to get a flight every second week like I'm flying every single week this month and it's just that I have to put it down for multiple days and then when I when I have put it down and I've taken the five days then I don't immediately want to get back in so it's like when I do, I'm committed to it, but then I have to stop basically mm. uh, because it does have one of the most addictive feedback loops of anything. You know, there's like so many memes about, oh, I'll just get to the next level or I'll just finish the next level. And, and Persona <laughs> is like so intensely that, especially because it fast tracks everything. You know, like if you have something to do or you make an appointment with someone, you don't have to like open your map and go there. It just takes you there. And because of that, everything feels so fast, even though it's a hundred hour game. It's like, it goes through everything so quickly that I, I think if I didn't travel and if I weren't trying to get through so many other games all the time, then I would have finished it in a month probably. But I'm also liking spreading it out. Like I, I'm, I'm liking having this long relationship with Persona, but I think it'll no. like when I finish it, I'll be sad. You know, when you finish a good book series and you're like, oh man, like I think I'll probably have that. I, I kind of don't want it to end, honestly. So. I yeah. still think if this game was on the Switch, I would have finished it a very long time ago. I yeah. would have just carried it with me everywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, be because JRPGs and portable systems, good shit. Yeah, I completely that's, agree. That, that's, to me, where it, it would have fit better. Because I just have a weird... It's a strange disconnect for me. Like, I have to turn on my PlayStation <laughs> until it <laughs> gets a Persona. Whereas before, I just had my Vita, and I was carrying it around, and it was with me everywhere, and... I, I think I just enjoyed that a lot more. I don't like having to... It's weird that I don't like having to set up my couch to play Persona. No, I get I that. mean, if you I, played I the played other Persona one. on my treadmill. So, like, literally, I, the entirety of Persona 5 was played while I walked on the treadmill. It was fantastic. Um, but I understand what you're saying, Simon. Like, I play a lot of indies on the Switch that I only would want to play on the Switch. Something about having that portable experience is, like, kind of comforting. I don't know. It's weird. We're weird. It's it good. happens. Yeah. I'm just taking a nap over here. Don't mind me. I know. I, was I know. Andrea, did you not you play it? Okay, Andrea, no. I was napping gotcha. during you guys talking about Moss. So. <laughs> Listen, we've talked about Moss one time. You've talked oh, about Persona okay. like literally the last five weeks of this show. Okay, you know what? It's getting really good. Like after hitting that in end game, whatever, what sure, I sure, when sure, that sure, kerfuffle. Sure, sure. I'm gonna keep powering through, Andrew. You got me talking. I'm gonna keep you, talking. You gotta, you gotta play at least a little something different for next week's timer. I played Florence this week. Okay, I guess that's thirty minutes. Thirty minutes of counts. something else. <laughs> and I'm going to. So I'm, I'm staying at a friend's house for a little bit because I'm dog sitting. So I'm gonna bring my Switch, which means I will play something else. Yeah, girl. Uh, Alana, does your shirt say Chicken Kicker? Chicken Chaser, yeah, it's from Fable. Chaser, yeah. I meant, yes. Amazing. 
You can see her shirt at youtube.com slash what's good games. <laughs> it's true. It's an amazing yeah. shirt. Hit that subscribe button, ladies and gentlemen. We'd love, <laughs> we'd love to get your support. Like, yeah. comment. Notifications. Yeah, hit the bell. Oh yeah, hit that bell. <laughs> so when we That's go, so when we now. post a video, you always know mm-hmm. when to uh, when to get it. Yeah, I heard that. I heard this from Xavier Woods. Hit that bell. Yeah, that's the kids push, are saying that. He's now. pushing. Um, he's pushing the the, the subs for mm-hmm. his channel. Up, up, down, down. I believe it is. He's a yeah, good dude. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The WWE superstar. Um. So Andrea, you've yes. been playing more Monster Hunter. I, I want to know. Have. Are you sticking with the butterfly armor or have you got something even shinier now? So I want to stick with the butterfly armor, but now that I'm high rank, I've upgraded my low rank stuff as far as it could be upgraded. And it's still like, it's not cutting it. So I had to forge some new high rank armor because I don't have all of the materials yet. Cause now I have to recollect the materials to forge my butterfly armor in high rank version but I've managed to do the Zora Magdaros quest like four times because I've just been with people who's, who, who's gotten it to appear. So this quest randomly appears um, while you're just out playing other quests. Like you'll get a notification that the Zora Magdaros has been spotted and you can replay that quest line, which lets you get more material. So I have three pieces of the five piece Zora beta set. I like the beta set because in the high rank, there's two versions of each set, which is pretty cool. There's some really fun armor sets in the high rank mode, but there's a lot of pieces that I don't have, and you re- it requires you to to slay a lot more monsters mm-hmm. for each set of armor than the low rank was. It's obviously, like it's gonna be more work because it's high rank. I but don't I'm just like, remember what the name of my favorite dragon is, but it's the white dragon that's in the Coral Highlands. The Legiana? Yes, Legiana. And yeah. it's I think it's the beta set that I like better there as well because it's all flowy. There's like multiple pots of capes and it's like, oh, it's so cool. Oh, capes? You have to fight her a That's my trigger word. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody said cape? <laughs> capes, capes. Um, I, I finally just... has this fascination with Cullen. Yes, <laughs> we, we don't need to talk about the fur capes again. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> there's also the Kieran, which is a really cool monster who doesn't really feel like a monster. It looks... It's kind of like a minotaur, but the head is like a lion hmm. and it's like a horse body, but it's all like blue and silver and it's like uh, got electric fur and it's like a thunder, uh, thunder element animal. And so like it constantly like, throws lightning at you. So it's kind of a bitch to fight, yeah. but wow, the armor set is really cool looking and I've only managed to spot this uh, monster one time. In all of my uh, escapades in the Coral Highlands, which is Did cool. you kill it? I did kill it. I was trying to trap it, but I had a shock trap, and the shock traps don't work on that because mm. it's a thunder mm. monster. So you I couldn't kill him. So I I think that there's a way for me to capture it. I just got to like probably like go back to the wiki. I was talking last week on the show how all of my Google searches are like Monster Hunter World, like wiki searches. I permanently <laughs> have a persona, like the answer to the quizzes open. So, like, I just oh, yeah. don't close that tab on my phone. I'm like, I'm going to need it again next time there's a quiz. So I'll just leave it there, yeah. I guess. So, like, like a, there's a sheet that's just like, how's he has all the easiest ways to level up all of your various things. I'm like, just leave that open and then, and then we're good. But, like, with Monster Hunter, I think that's a game. Like, that and Dark Souls to anyone who plays them. I'm like, play with a guide open. Like, there's no shame in doing that. I think it yeah. makes it a better experience, ultimately. Like, and don't use it until you need it. But when you do, totally use it. Otherwise, you just get frustrated. So. There's just so many systems that I... Yeah. And the, and the game gives you a, like a little bit of a tutorial, but not enough. There's just so many things that I don't understand because the systems are so complex that, I mean, I feel like I'm just constantly looking for them. Like the system, the game doesn't tell you where to get all of the new sacks. I remember I had to look up how to get a paralysis sack um, to get the butterfly armor set in low rank. And I was like, oh, I have to slay a great Gyros in order to get the paralysis sack. But now all the sacks are changed. They're different names. And like the guy doesn't tell you or the, um, the game doesn't tell you where to get the high rank sacks. Mm-hmm. You just got to like figure it out. What, what's this face you're making? Oh, Steinberg. sorry. Britt and I are having a moment <laughs> with, your, with your repeated use of the word sack. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We are. That's fine. Continue on, Andrea. You said you. We don't mean to We're interrupt not here. you. We just make faces at each other sometimes. Oh, yeah. Can you give <laughs> each other googly eyes? Okay. Okay. I get it. I get it. Um, 
But um, one of the things I wanted to bring up when we were doing the show this week was I had this moment, which makes Monster Hunter so great. And I think this is clearly why fans of the franchise have loved this game for a long time was I was on a quest, uh, optional quest to hunt down an Anjanath in the wild spire waste. And normally you hunt them in the ancient forest. And so I was there and there was a moment where I'm out in this plateau and uh, Diablos comes and starts fighting the Anjanath. And then uh, Barros comes. And so all three... Wait, what? You keep making faces, Brittany. Oh, no, Diablo I was just Diablo. Oh, yeah, with the <laughs> horns. <laughs> um, and so the, all three of these monsters are in like a three-way fight. I and love I, when that happens. So I'm like, you guys sort it out. I'll be over here, and then I'll come back when you're done. Exactly. It's that's great. exactly what I did. I was like, <laughs> I need to find a place dead. to hide so I don't get stomped to death. Um, but it was just like the scale of it was so much fun they to watch. They also have different animations based on when like certain monsters are fighting each other. So there are some that have like pre-designed animations. It's like, oh, if this guy fights this guy, this is how it looks. And I think that's so cool that it's not just like repetitive animations. Like the monsters, I still feel bad about killing them because they seem so realistic. Especially yes. that it's like, I'm just walking into your house killing you so i can make cool clothes out of it and i still feel guilty about it probably more than any other game i've ever played i'm just like i'm oh, so come sorry on. shadow so of the beautiful. colossus you feel fucking terrible in that's, that game. that's a good yeah. good one also yeah, yeah. You're yeah. just like, I'm the worst. Yeah. <laughs> At least in Monster Hunter, you know you're doing, well, you don't know. I didn't know this until I went online. You're trying to control the monster population. That's the reasoning, the justification they give. Shadow of the Colossus, I feel like I'm just stabbing these hairy titan guys for no Just, just to help titan, your sleeping sister? Yeah. She's not even that cool. I've never even spoken to her. She could have been asleep the whole time. <laughs> Not you can't it. possibly be worth this. <laughs> She's not worth killing 16 of them or however many it is. That's not, yeah, I know, no. right? Like, they're all unique. Yeah. Like, they're, once they're dead, they're dead. She's just one no sleepy like girl. Like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> can I just go around the wall and hang out with them? Like, do I yeah. really have to? <laughs> like, climb them but snuggle them yeah. instead. You just pet yeah. their weak point. That'd be way better. <laughs> yeah. We just got to rewrite Friend that. Friend of the yeah. Colossus. Remake the game. I don't care the if she director's naps cut Shadow of Colossus. Like, <laughs> respect a sleepy girl. Like, I get that. Maybe she's just tired. Exactly. Like, give the girl a break. <laughs> but that's why I try to capture as many monsters as possible yeah. instead of slaying them. But they've made it so that there's specific parts of the monster that you have to slay them in order to carve them, which I kind of hate. I wish that they would allow you to capture um, and get all of the same parts. Because you do get a little bit more materials of other types when you capture. But you can only carry one shock trap at a time. Mm. And so then if you have a quest which requires you to get more than one monster, you got to go back to camp and get another one out of your item box. It's annoying. They just need that to get a destiny like item a manager so you can move the <laughs> items around with your yeah. phone. That would be good. That would be so Or good. just like let you carry more than one. Or yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Their inventory management, I will say, is pretty excellent because I haven't had to delete or sell a bunch of stuff. I've, like, not sold anything, really. Yeah, it doesn't yet. have garbage trinkets. And I would right. also even think that only one shock trap thing is intentional. It's like, we want you to make sure, sure. you use this carefully. And, like, I get that, too. Like, it's it making you we sad. We want probably... you to murder a lot of things. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sure. Or they want, yeah. Or they want you to work hard for that extra experience that you get or those extra whatevers you get. He works hard for the monsters. E -e -e -e. So hard for the monsters. <laughs> Stimer, you didn't expect that best. one. That was good. <laughs> Oh man! <laughs> but I'm I'm having I'm having fun. I'm I'm slowly but surely getting some more WG fans into the WGG um, squad. It's hard to invite people to the squad because they have to be in my online session. And in order for them to get into my online session, I have to invite them in because the idea that they are going to just magically find it. I have been periodically. My goal is to when I'm going to be playing for a while, I'll be posting my online session ID in the Discord. So I did that late on Saturday night when I knew I was going to have a late one. Um, but then I got kicked from that online session. So oh. um, that is one thing that game is really bad at is for a game that you're supposed to play with friends, actually letting you play with friends. It's yes. bad. at yeah. that. They need to fix that. It's not yeah. good. Yeah. They make you jump through unnecessary hoops. And several of them. It's yeah. Yes. It's dumb. So hopefully soon. Come on, Capcom. You've got to be rolling in the Monster Hunter dough yeah. now. You sold 7.5 million copies. 
You can fix your online infrastructure. I believe in you. <laughs> so, um, Britt, did you want to talk about paranormal activity at all? Fuck that shit. Okay. <laughs> I've actually played a little bit of that too, but it was forever oh. ago. But Yeah. Um, the, what I will say is I only maybe played like 20 minutes of it and then I about shit my pants. The control scheme on a DualShock is like barely acceptable. Um, I, the, the PSVR did come with move controllers and I did buy move controllers back in the day when it was supposed to change everything. Remember the, that <laughs> public? Yeah. Um, but I have no idea where they are now. So I bought the move controllers. They had a charge, so I wasn't able to use them. Uh, yeah, you know, I love horror games. I love being scared. The problem when you're playing VR is you can't cover your eyes. It's just not a thing you can do. You don't cover your eyes. I've played horror games with you. Have you seen, ladies and gentlemen, our show at <laughs> facebook.com slash lights off show where Brittany stares wide eyed into the horror the whole time. Her eyes are literally like this, you guys, just like screaming <laughs> eyes as wide as they possibly can be. Trust me, I took so many screenshots as proof <laughs> this happened but that's it's like crazy. i'm i'm there covering like cowering in a corner and she's screaming with her eyes just like dead i had i had to protect you steimer like that was my instincts yes. coming over you, the thing you were like via horror clump. you at least like it's even if you don't physically want to put your eyes like cover your eyes you don't even have the setting around you that's familiar to be like oh this is what the real world is i know my living room this is happening on a screen like vr horror is so much scarier than any other kind of horror and oh, like the, yeah. the what i played a paranormal activity it's like i got to a part where you're like walking up a staircase and the staircase starts, starts to change color and then that like a, a, a something falls down and then there's someone behind me and i was like you know what it's too much that's three jump scares in one i'm i'm good like, <laughs> And I'm out. Like, and I'm out. <laughs> it and seems I'm like out. it's, yeah, it's exactly almost like a point exactly. and click adventure game mechanically, which is cool to me. But it was just like, you know, you hear someone whispering and then like scuttering. And it's like, I, no, nope, not doing it. Nope. <laughs> just with that 3D audio shenanigans. Yeah. But I so like for me, you know, like I said, I love the horror stuff. But usually if I have a few drinks beforehand, it helps like lessen the reaction time. So I can kind of like understand what's going on and I'm okay. But um, in VR, yeah, you know, it doesn't really make much of a difference for me. So there was a room I walked in and this is all in VR. And there's like a creepy, like those clowns that you can like bop and they like tilt down and they pop oh, back yeah, up. The punchy clowns. Oh. The punchy clowns. Bo yeah, the, yeah. And it's the bozo it's watch things, right? Yep. Bo exactly. Bozo. So Bozo's watching this TV. That's something but static, which is very like, you know, paranormal activity ish. And there's a record player playing some music from like the 30s or 40s. So I go over and that shit was freaking me out. So I paused it and I turned around and started walking away and then different music started playing. So, you know, in a game like I feel, you know, in non VR, you would use the analog to like turn around and look. I like literally like used my head and I slowly turned it to look at the record player and then the music stopped. And I'm like, okay, fine. So then I. Yep. So then I started nope. walking through the door and music start, started playing again. Then I stopped dead in my tracks. I look behind me and the music stopped. And I'm like, all right, I got to get really drunk if I'm going to play this. But I couldn't because we had to record the show. <laughs> um, I mean, that stuff have. gets me so bad. The scariest part of PT uh -huh. to me, which is one of my favorite games ever, is just when the audio says, look behind you. And there's oh! nothing behind you. It's just that it no. says that. And you're like, oh, no. And I was playing the, um, the Inpatient recently. And that has a part where you're like playing with this like doll box and you can like pick up your own doll and then you put it back. And then like when, once you put yourself back down inside of it, you see that there's something behind you like in the doll box. So you're like, OK, I pick this up. I put this down. Oh, wait, is that me? This looks like the room that I'm in. And then a figure shows up behind you in the box. And I was like, that's no. someone behind me. That's Oh, no, there's someone <laughs> behind me. And you turn around and there is. And it's just that's the thing that gets me is like when they're like, hey, what if you looked around? And I'm like, no, I, don't make I don't me do that. Wanna. Why? <laughs> And that's the thing. It's so cliche, but VR really takes horror to a whole new level. Yeah. It's You don't have personal you know, space. That's the thing. It's like, I think that VR horror is probably scarier than even real life because you don't have personal space. It's just exactly. everything you're seeing is what's there. And it's it's terrifying. And I also love horror games. Like, I'm, I'm addicted to them. I play them all the time. It's probably my favorite genre. But when it comes to VR, I'm just like, nope. <laughs> like, this is torture, effectively. Like, I'm good. I'm out. I just can't do it. It's man, it's hard. I know it's hard, but I can't help it. It's, the minute <laughs> I stop playing a horror game, I want to be back in that horror game. But then as soon as I get in it, I realize how scary it is again. It's a vicious cycle. Yeah. No one wins. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. Fuck that shit. So I will <laughs> not be playing this game. Um, no. I will take your word for it that it's a big nope. 
and <laughs> I will go back and finish Moss instead. <laughs> and then I'll probably put my PSVR in the corner again for another six months until something else comes out. Oh, uh. um, no, just kidding. I'm gonna try. I'm gonna try to play more. It's just so many chords, and they're all over my coffee table right now. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is a bozo doll, by the way. I was correct. Bozo. I thought for sure I might have been wrong. Nope, I get it. Did it. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take another quick break. When we come back, we've got to give some awesome shout outs to our wonderful Turbo patrons. Plus, we're going to learn about what Miss Alana does at IGN all day long. You're going to talk about Red Lips Orange Car, and then maybe we can even talk about your DJ skills. Sure. Yeah. We'll do that. All kinds of fun stuff. Stick with us. We'll be right back. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. This is the final segment of the What's Good Games podcast, and this is the time of the month where we love to give. <laughs> I just, I mean, literally, I mean, come on. Sorry, I'm, I'm sorry. Eight. We are twelve. Are you sorry? Are How much whiskey have you had tonight? I've had zero, and I laugh. Yeah. <laughs> Every time I open a bottle of wine when I'm at home by myself, I, I think of Steimer being like, "I don't have any alcohol in my house," and me being like, "Pop." I'm alone and drinking. I have a bottle of wine now. I have one bottle. <laughs> just going to send you home with some wine next time you come into town. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> no, my camera got popped out of focus. Come back into focus, Brio. You can do it. I believe in you. We are professional. Yeah, for the record, totally. I haven't known which camera to look at, so I've been looking at both. It's the, see the little white light? It's the small one? Yeah. I've been looking at both. I do have three cameras here, so I understand the confusion, <laughs> but <laughs> it's... All right. Good to know. It's the one with the light on it. If I it. look like I'm looking slightly to the left to anyone who's watching this video, <laughs> that's why. One time, I did an entire intro for the podcast looking at the wrong camera, oh. and then I was like, well, it's too so late now. We had that at work once where we shot an unboxing, <laughs> and the entire time I was with Marty, and he was looking at the wrong camera, and I guess, like, I didn't know that, so we literally had to scrap it. But, like, oh, well, we've no. already unboxed oh, the no. thing. We can't redo it, but it's, like, so awkward because the whole time he's looking to the right. It's like, <laughs> <laughs> wow. It's if only we could have figured that out. Well, if only you had had one away. of your many producers who were they were there. Idea. Like, you know, it's so, so dumb. You're like, look over here. Camera two. Camera two. Okay. Um, This is where we say a big thank you to all of our amazing Turbo patrons, our IRL patrons, our Care Package patrons, our WGG producer patrons, and our wonderful sponsors for helping support everything that we do here at What's Good Games uh, without you guys, without the amazing um, comments, the emails, the YouTube messages, everything that you guys do makes it um, makes it worth it for us to do this show every month. Not that we don't love talking about games, not that we don't love seeing each other, but you guys really give us the amazing feedback to keep us going and to, to make us have all the feels about everything. I'm going to yes. try, I'm not communicating properly cause I'm, I'm trying not to get emotional, but you guys are <laughs> great and we love you. And I want to say thank you. So I'm going to read these names. Um, as I'm about to read this list, I remember an email that came in that was like, this is how you pronounce my name. So I'm going to try to quickly scroll through and make sure I have that phonetic pronunciation in there. Cause I'm uh, undoubtedly I'm going to screw it up again. Um, I also love this series, this time, I mean, because Andrea always butchers all of the names, and it's always good. Well, there's one in there that just says Sam. Yes. Without a yeah. Sam. You'll if, get that if one. You, <laughs> yeah, if you can't get that's Sam, my, That's my Starbucks name, issues. Sam. Uh, it's Sam, actually. It's Sam. <laughs> no! <laughs> oh, crap! For one time! <laughs> I pick it because everybody knows how to spell it. Everybody knows how to say it. And so when I you go... You know how to oh. say your mom's name. You nail your mom's name every time. The, the, I well, found listen. the email, Andrea. Okay, good. Will you add it into the doc? <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'll get you. If I screwed up my mom's name, Steimer, I would be in deep doo-doo. Come on. That would be pretty funny. It would be funny. Should I just mispronounce her name just for funsies? <laughs> Do it. She doesn't listen to this show just anyway. Throw it out of one day and see how she, she reacts. She tells me that she does, but I have yet to quiz her to be, see if she actually does. I'm well, just this like, will be a good test right here. I'd be like, so, Mom, did you did you hear how I pronounced your name this month? And she'd be like, what are you talking about? I'd be like, that's what I thought. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay, Mom. You don't have to listen to the, to the show. I appreciate that you okay, support here we go. And everything I do. Okay, here we go. Um, we're going to start with Alex Rogopoulos, Tim Ross, Thomas Bach, 
Thomas. We don't call you Thomas. We call you Tom. Lincoln Davis, Martha J. Emery, David Icolucci, Stephen Insler, Matthew Simpson, Michelle Villegas, Kia Bright, Steph Wu, Daniel Raymond, George, Ralph, Austin Riley, Dustin Lewis, Paul Falcon, Tara Bruno, Stephanie DuPont, Kyle Heyman, Amar Dillon, Sion Stevenson, Aaron J. Saxton, Gary Welburn, Benjamin Pardew, Adrian Williams, R.J. Bryan, Trevor Starkey, Joe Schleif, Tom Coots, Elmo Shell, Jared Howard, Carl Peterson, Kathy Lucas, Molly Bittner, Joselle Bassa, Muhammad Muhammad, Nam H. Bowie, Jeff Hutchinson, Jeff, Jennifer McNichol, Jacob B. Jacob Beeman? Beeman. That's right. Jay Mahal. Mahai? Mahai. 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 Albert Andres Videla. E is Zari. E is Zari. E is Zari. Oh my gosh. E is Zari. I was doing so good. E is Zari. Robert Herrero. John Drake. Joe Kennison. Bill Stillwell. Jason Erickson. Sam Baptiste. No Clip, which is Danny O'Dwyer's uh-huh. Patreon. You should go support him as well. Adam Rapone. Not the figure skater. <laughs> <laughs> Kevin Dunkel. Well, that'd be Billy, pretty cool. It was a good story. Uh, Billy Shively, Stephanie Fitzwilliams, Sam, Jason T. Barnes, Harrison Pink, Jesse Giovale, Tommy Larson, Ross Haney, Jessica Salisbury, Nicole Humphrey, Mike Lynch, Brooke Larie, Asia Harris, Anthony Murphy, Kyle Somerville, Christopher Leone, Ethan Anderson, Sydney Carr, Gio Corsi, Marcus Brown, Materia Addict, Matthew Godere, Tyler McCall, Shane Remo, Reom, Reom. Matt Howell, Ozzy Mejia, Christian Rodriguez, Nathan Drake of Uncharted fame, <laughs> Trice Bradlin, Louis Creech, Donato, Sinichio the Third, Tony Hahn, Genevieve Schultz, and my mama, Teresa, and Hart. <laughs> <laughs> That's new. That's I, not I how you say your name, but we'll names. see if she finds out. And I think that you should start ordering them so it's like a pokey wrap, so like every fourth one rhymes. <gasps> So oh, you can wrap them. That would be really hard. It would. That would be me. I can play the music. I'll play the music in the background. Yeah. It would be perfect. Oh, my God. Maybe for our one-year anniversary, I could put the time in for that. <laughs> a lot I love you. Okay. Be on the show we'll, every week. We'll work Come on this, us. ladies yeah. and gentlemen. Bring you can a, just yeah. make up some names. That's true. <laughs> just yeah. throw some in there for rhyming purposes. It'll be fine. Nobody <laughs> will ever know. It's, like, <laughs> it's almost back in focus. It's not. I'm weirdly putting my hands up to the camera again, hoping that it would find me, but it won't. This doesn't look weird at all. This no, it doesn't. It looks fine. No. It's um, not focused on anything, though. It's not like it's focused on the background. I know. What it's just... you... is it... Oh, is there a ghost? There's, There's a ghost. Oh, oh no. no. Same ghost that opened my door earlier. It's here now? The it's ghost here. Is not it's teleported. Oh, no. Um, but we are here to talk about IGN's Alana Pierce. Hi. So, yeah, we are. Um, you and I met very briefly at a con two years ago, I think. I don't remember how I met you, but that sounds right. Yeah. That's how I've met most of the people in, in this industry. Was, that's yep. how we, that's, how I, that's met. how I met both of you, too, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yep. Yep. Con and mentioned. So you started <laughs> out um, at IGN working as the toys editor, right? Yeah, toys and culture editor two years ago. Yeah. Um, but I sought it out like the the in Australia. I was writing as a freelance journalist for a long time, and then I started going part time, and then I was full time. Started it at IGN as a toys and culture editor, um, and then now I'm a producer. But that means a lot of things. It means I write, I host, and I produce video content. So it's like the titles at IGN are very confusing sometimes because like so many people wear so many hats. But yeah, that's yeah. digital media these days, yeah. right? So I'm still technically the toys and culture editor as well. Um, I just now oh. do a bunch of other stuff also. So. That sounds right. Just give you more responsibility. Yep. Yeah. Throw yeah. more things on you. That's fine. exactly what they do. Yeah. <laughs> and it's still fun though. Like it, like the part of it was, you know, they spoke about um, the culture part is like me covering cosplay and they spoke about having someone cover cosplay instead. And I was like, but what if they don't do it right? <laughs> it's like, what if you, <laughs> Oh, can't give it up what now. What if they can't do it? <laughs> it's just like, I got like got really worried about it, but yeah, um, it's, it's been an awesome place to work and you know, the, U.S. games industry is so much bigger than it was in Australia that it's like it's just it's, it's so huge. Even working at a company like IGN and having seen IGN Australia, it's just so much bigger. It's it's insane and it's just like consistently exciting, basically. And you also worked on the Disney XD project, the IGN show. How was that? Yeah. Oh boy. <laughs> that was <laughs> from the other people oh I've boy. talked to that worked on that. It sounded like you guys shot quite a bit of content in a very short amount of time yeah we found out like two weeks uh before we started filming that we were going to do it and you know everyone else who was on that block started filming in like november so it was crazy um but it was crazy for everyone who worked on it you know we were 
trying to get that show made was like every Monday and Tuesday we were working from 8 a.m. till about 9 p.m. the Ugh. whole time for three months straight. I worked Yikes. every Ooh. single weekend. Um, you know, traveled every week, almost every weekend. Like it was a brutal period of time, but also a ton of fun. Um, sure. I like the other people that that were hosted on that show. Like we had Naomi Kyle, James Duggan, uh, William Haynes. And they're all just like everyone who worked on it was just awesome people. So it was it was tons of fun. Like I have to give a shout out to William Haynes if you if you don't know him, he started on Sourcebed and he was like our guest host for that show. And he's just like such a cool guy that it was like a good experience getting to meet all those people. But also one of the the most exhausting things I've ever done for sure. It was it was brutal. We didn't make any money from it. Like it was just like a it was just like a let's make a show. Cool. All right. Guess we're doing it. It was just like a man. It was rough. It did you guys rough. find that you maybe got some new audience from that? Did you get some people maybe reaching out to you on Twitter or social media saying like, hey, I found you on Disney XD. So funnily enough, um, they didn't reach out to me on social media, but I did meet people who, who said, oh, I saw you on Disney. And that happened at VidCon specifically. So it was like our that audience right. is older. Yeah. And so when there's younger audiences, they tend to say, oh, you're Alana from IGN Snapchat or you're Alana from mm. Disney. And it's very weird, like watching how those trends are changing. And But yeah, we did. We got a new audience from it. Um, and it was like a huge learning experience. Like everyone in the office, like, you know, we have, I have a producer credit on a TV show now. And that's super cool. Like it was, it was crazy. Um, I have no idea if we're going to bring the show back or anything like that at this point. But yeah, it was very full on, a lot of fun, a lot of, a lot of people working together to make this thing every day for three months straight. Like you just don't think about that kind of stuff. I actually did work on TV before I started working at IGN, but I was only producing a segment of 10 minutes. So it was way different. Whereas this is like half an hour a day with the, the segments all have to be two minutes a piece. Like the TV show I worked on in Australia was like, Hey guys, uh, fallout four just came out. Um, I'm going to do two five minute segments reviewing fallout four. And they'd be like, cool, have fun. And so I would just write a 3000 word script. Whereas this is like, no, they all have to be different all the time. And it was just, yeah, it was crazy. It was, it was fun, but crazy. Yeah, I can only imagine. I mean, we did something similar when I was on GameStop TV where the segments were all like 60 seconds. And right as I left is when they were transitioning to the format they're in now where they're a little bit longer. But um, you don't realize for people who've never written for for broadcast just how much script writing it is Mm -hmm. that goes into like an hour's worth of content when you're breaking it down to like... 60 second or two minute increments yeah they actually just hired three girls i'm friends with and now hosting um gamestop tv uh who it's it's melanie mack one of the girls i don't remember the name of uh but the the other two are streamers though melanie mack's like a popular youtuber that you probably know but the other two are like quite popular streamers and like the three of them are awesome and i'm like really excited about what their direction is going forward with that one it's it yeah, seems like it's, it's really cool. It's they've definitely taken it into a direction where they are really trying to tap into gamer culture and to make it more authentic and make it feel less like marketing and advertising and more mm-hmm. like, hey, we're making gaming content. We hope you're going to stop and watch. Yeah, less towards the parents who are in the store and more towards the actual gamers who are in the store. Yeah, totally, which is cool. Not to say that parents can't be gamers. Of course, we have lots of parents who are gamers who listen to this show. <laughs> but yes. typically speaking. Parents who go into a GameStop with their kids, they previously have not been targeted as parents who play with their children. Instead yeah. of been like, hey, mom and dad, who knows nothing about video games? Have you heard let of Knack 2? Let me oh, <laughs> you in the head with details about Pokemon. <laughs> um, so um, that's really awesome. Has there been like a particular project you've worked on so far that you were really proud of or that you were really excited to do or like a place that you've gone that you were like, wow, that was super awesome? I mean, one of my favorite things I've gotten to do is uh, I was the events host for Xbox for uh, several years in Australia. And my first Gamescom was just the best thing ever um, because it was, you know, I got to go on my birthday because it falls on my birthday almost every year. So that was the best also. But it was the flight from Australia takes almost three days to get there. Yikes. And then, oh my you know, God. we land, we drop our stuff off. We go to the Xbox briefing. We have to make videos there. There's like an activation that night where Girl. on the show floor for the next two days. And then we fly back. And it's like brutal. It was insane, but just so much fun. And I, I think... The international stuff's my favorite. Like I did Paris Games Week as a host for PlayStation a few years ago, and that was awesome as well. And it's like the international stuff just every single time just like blows my mind. But it's also, I'm sure a lot of people who work in the industry feel the same way. It's just talking to people that have made stuff that I love. is just always really, really cool. Like talking to Tim Schafer for a while at DICE is just like, dude, you're you're so great. (laughs) You're just so cool. And he's such a nice dude, too. I was very drunk, and I was like... (laughs) 
the, so the way it happened was I was like, he probably was too. It's okay. I've spoken to him yeah. a few times before and I was like, I've spoken to Tim a couple of times now. Uh, and I was talking to Marty, who's one of my colleagues at IGN. And I was like, Tim's over there. I'm going to go talk to him. And Marty was like, okay. And so I just walk up to him smashed and I feel like I was having this conversation about like Broken Age and like how well written it was and how I really liked the two character dynamic <laughs> just like talking to him about this <laughs> and then the next morning I was like he probably thought I was a fucking idiot like I like went over there trying to be like I think this man knows my name now and I can walk up to him and it'll be fine and then I just like blabbed to him about how much I like Broken Age I was like you oh, like, come on man like, <laughs> okay Alana oh. I have a very scarily similar story with Tim Schaefer. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so, I'm so trying to get the camera back. back I was working at IGN. I hadn't met Tim yet. And we were at 21st Amendment, which is like a bar that's yeah, right next to the Yeah, very office. familiar with that place. And I don't remember what this event was, but we were all drinking and like Tim Schaefer showed up. I don't remember why. And I was a little drunk. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my God, it's Tim Schaefer. I love Monkey Island. <laughs> So I walk over there. I'm like, hi, Monkey Island is the best. My gamer tags Governor Marley because she's cool. And like, I don't know. I just start blabbing to him. And I see his face and it's just like deer in headlights. That's exactly what I did. That's exactly that. <laughs> and then I was like, I could see that he was really like, who the fuck is this? But I couldn't stop talking. <laughs> That's exactly what happened to me. <laughs> it's not even the first time I met okay. him. And it's okay. Tim and I are friends now, and it's fine. <sighs> but like, oh, God, oh, it was God. real embarrassing. I just <laughs> hope that he was drunk enough to not remember how bad that was. Like, Tim like was I didn't realize. Sober. At the time, I was like, killed it. I was so confident. Had this great conversation with this dude that I, I like, have always really looked up to. Like, totally fine. The next morning, I was like, that, none of that went well. That was definitely <laughs> terrible. <laughs> just... He was dead sober when I was talking to him because he had just shown up. That's worse. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. Oh, and, no. Yeah. <laughs> I definitely am going to send this t clip to him. And be oh, like, no. Tim, do you remember this? <laughs> Can we get comment? <laughs> he's such a great person. He's he he's really fun. Um, I actually had the pleasure of walking with him and his family during the Women's March here That's in awesome. San Francisco when it happened um, for the first time last year. I believe that was no the year before last year oh my gosh time yeah where does it go last year i think La it was yeah. March last year yeah last I year yeah i think so yeah. um and we are just uh coming off of celebrating international women's day you're putting together a big stream for ign for women's day yeah the vod should be up by the time that you watch this and that's the thing that i've been working stupidly hard on and i'm also really excited about what <laughs> I don't know how to speak about it in past tense, but <laughs> we have raised some amount of money for charities. <laughs> uh, it's Girls Who Code and the Malala Foundation, both of which are like about getting more women in tech and like trying to close that gender gap that exists in tech work. And uh, yeah, I've been trying to do charity streams since I started at IGN and we've had so many meetings and then for some reason it'll fall apart. And this is the first one that I managed to put together and it's been really hard. Um, it was a lot more work than I would have thought. And the focus of it, which I'm also really proud of is... It's about women who've created games. So we have like Portal is one of the games on stream because of Kim Swift. Kim Swift and then yeah. Halo is like Bonnie Ross and uh, Shannon Copa who worked on The Sims. And it's basically for that reason, like so we could still have men on the stream because it was like meant to be a celebratory thing and not just like a, this is just women for a day. So I wanted to make it like include everyone, but like celebrate women at the same time. And I'm really happy with uh, the way everything's really come together. And it, yeah, it's I now have just so much respect for the people who plan like the full E3 live streams. It's like, I had someone just text me like an hour ago being like, hey, uh, I feel sick and I'm not going to make the stream tomorrow. I'm like, oh, no. Like now I just have to like deal with that. And there's so many people just being like, hey, what time am I doing? Like I have a meeting now. And I'm like, oh, my God. Like it's, it's really well, hard. If managing you need so someone to schedules. fill in, you just let me know and I'll come down well, and take totally somebody's spot. To come down. It'll be fun. You can totally do that if you want to. Yeah. Maybe we, I, well, maybe someone's I sick will. Now, so you want to play a little big planet? <laughs> Shout out to Siobhan Reddy. <laughs> I'm terrible at Little Big Planet. I so am I. I, I rescind my invitation. Wait, no, that's not how that works. <laughs> my self invitation Can is you rescinded. Do that? No. no, no, you can't, Simer. That's not how that works at all. Um, so you also have a brand new podcast. Mm -hmm. You guys are in what episode five is coming up? A uh, four, yeah. Um, we've had so far Zach Ryan, Jared Petty. Joey Noel from Kind of Funny, who I'm sure you know quite well. Oh, yeah. She's been a guest on our show. Yeah, and we're getting um, Mr. Petty is going to be a guest on What's Good he's sometime also in the coming weeks as well. 
we always talk about like the the San Francisco podcast universe and how it's just like this overlapping group of people. But I kind of love true. it. It's great. Yeah, um, love it. So the podcast started because uh, at, at IGN there are some content restrictions that are basically not not compete stuff. But long story. But the idea is like we're not allowed to start a games podcast, and I totally get that. And I was like, I want to start a podcast. What do I want to do? It's very hard to do things that aren't related to like you can't do anything geeky. So it's like, what am I going to talk about? And then I was like, why don't I just pick something that is completely out of left field that I don't even have interest in that is just always going to generate stories that we have to talk about. So the idea is myself, Marty, who's my co-host, and then a guest every second week, uh, pull a story we found on Craigslist Misconnections. And you can pull it for, you can't tell the others what it's about. So when you start the show, it's like everyone's hearing the story for the first time. And it can be something that you find funny, something that you have a story that relates to, something that you think is like very sweet or very problematic or just like whatever you want to say about the story you can, that we sort of, we name the people who are in them and then sort of like try and fill out their backstories. And it's been a lot of fun to record. Like every episode we've recorded, I think we've done 12 so far, 10 probably, uh, has been tons of fun because it's just both very funny, very surprising, a very interesting look at humanity. (laughs) But also just you never know where it's going to go. Um, so that was the reason that I asked if I could get R-rated is the oh, one. Always on one, What's Good Games. Yes. Yeah, you definitely can. Oh, yeah. The one thing that surprised me the most in having to look at Craigslist misconnections uh, so much is the amount of posts from dudes who are like, hey, not gay, married with kids, just want to suck a dick. Um, hit me up if I can suck your dick. And there's really? so many huh. of them. Wow. Like mountains of them or there's like hey totally not gay married like not looking for a relationship with a man not romantically interested in men just kind of want to fuck you just uh hit me up if you want to have some gay sex not nothing weird hey not gay just going through their college so phase a little late well i guess <laughs> it's it's I super know. interesting but I, I i ended up like after reading so many of these and like you know getting this weird glimpse into humanity that i wouldn't have otherwise i ended up texting my boyfriend and being like Hey, um, have you ever like, thought about <laughs> like sucking a dick? Like, like, if you did, that's fine. But like, <laughs> the look on your face is fucking priceless right now. Like, <laughs> did you post about like, would you do this? And he was like, Is this is this you? Did you post this? <laughs> yeah, like, but it, like, I feel like it's, particularly with him, it's fine because he's like, you know, the kind of dude who's like fine with being like that dude's hot. Which makes me like he's mm-hmm. probably not like a like a closeted gay dude because that tends to be the dudes who are like, oh, it's, yeah, it's disgusting. You cut. So it's like he's fine. He's just like, I don't know. Maybe he could post about wanting to suck a dick. I don't know. Like, it's so odd. And I was like trying to figure out where it comes from. And my thought. That's what she said. <laughs> my thought right now is that. True. <laughs> is that maybe it's dudes who are just like in long term relationships and are just like hey, it's probably easier for me to just post on Craigslist and have sex with a man than to, like, have sex with my wife who doesn't want to anymore. So they're just like... Do you think that they don't consider it cheating if it's a man? Oh, it's still definitely cheating, yeah. No, I know that it is, but I'm saying maybe they don't consider it cheating if it's a man. But the the thing with the... It gets thrown off by the I just want to suck a dick thing because then it's... That's... You do yeah, that one I don't understand. So I don't... I mean, I don't understand any of it, but... Human sexuality is a strange thing. You know, YOLO, you live once. If you've never sucked a dick before, now's your chance while you're on this earth. Craigslist. <laughs> Craigslist. There's a, big, there's a big market for it. Well, actually, there's more of a market for, like, people who want to for, suck like, dicks than there are for people who want to have their dicks sucked. That's so weird because it's I so feel weird. like... <laughs> isn't that a thing that normally men who don't have that in their personal sex lives pay somebody to do? But apparently there's all of these men wanting to do it Just for do it free on Craigslist. on Craigslist. Yeah. It's fascinating. And oh, I don't is. know what it means. I was very, I'm very surprised by that. Very interesting. I, I guess I had never thought about that. I, I, I also don't spend very much time or any time really in uh, misconnections. <laughs> See, I didn't until now. Here we are. <laughs> there's like a lot of them that anytime someone comes on the show, I'm like, here's what you have to do. Just like look at any city you want to pick a headline you think is interesting and start from there. But I always have to be like, full disclosure, going to see a lot of penises. Very sorry about that. Because there's just loads <laughs> of dick pics on there. I'm like just letting you know, if you're not comfortable with seeing loads of random dicks, just maybe don't do it. It's fine. <laughs> like it's, it's overwhelming, but it's, it does make for a very, fun podcast my favorite thing is that like i said before we name everyone so it's like they don't name themselves so based on their story like we have one that's like scary gary and then there was a shot bot and it's just like we just come up with names so we have a way to refer to the person we're talking about and yeah it's a lot of fun but very dumb 
I um, saw somebody post a misconnection on Facebook the other day about a guy who was in Costco looking for a woman who clearly farted and walked away yeah. and then came back. The girl that farts like a Cl- Clydesdale, yeah. was I believe. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he was like, I don't care that you put that you fart like a Clydesdale. You were really hot. I want to know who you are. Yeah. Some of them are. Yeah. They get pretty crazy. There's, That's uh, true love. Yeah. That's, That's the, like one of my favorite ones has been um, there was a girl who acts like I think the title was took a gamble on a fart and lost. And it, so it was a girl <laughs> on a date who like tried to fart and then I guess shat herself. Oh, while no. On the date. And he's like, I get it. Human functions. It was super funny, but also please see me again. And it's like, <laughs> she wouldn't though. You'd be so embarrassed. You would never see that person ever again. It's like, yeah. Strike oh, no. them from Ghosted. existence. Gone Pretty much. Forever. Yeah. It was one about uh, a, a girl who found a bat on the side of the road. And then a guy pulled over and like helped her get this bat into a box and then take it to the vet. And she oh, was just like. Like an animal. Yes. What did you I, think thought, I was like, who cares? I thought it was a baseball, baseball bat. bat. Oh. Oh. Like, no, <laughs> no like, like, a, a literal, like a bat like with a wings. Like a flying bat. And she just, like, wanted to text him to let him know that the bat had passed away and was like, hey, like, just hoping to track you down, just letting you know, like, we bonded over this. The bat has died. Um, I really wanted to tell you. (laughs) It's like, I don't know. Dude, but our love doesn't have to die with this bat. We can keep going. Yeah. Who are you? One of these days, you're going to get some fan mail from someone, and you're going to, like, make these connections happen, and it's going to be a glorious moment. The thing that I think is likely to happen is that someone will start writing them for our show. Like, people will write fake ones. And be like, okay, I just want to get this featured on the show. And like, they'll write something that's like falsely about us or something like that. And we'll be like, wait a minute. <laughs> I work at IGN. <laughs> this could be me. <laughs> that it sounds amazing. Silly. Yeah, I wonder yeah. how many of those misconnections are, are fake. Because I yeah. had no idea how prevalent fake Amazon reviews were until... That's a thing? Oh, yeah. There's tons of them. There, there's some products where like all of the reviews are fake. So wait, you don't have to buy a product to leave a review. They may have changed that recently, but um, there was a uh, one product. I can't remember what it was, um, but all of the reviews were fake, and they were just wow. hysterical. I think it was a TV. Yeah, so it was like a, it was like a really high end television, like a fifteen thousand dollar TV. And the, all the reviews were just hysterical, but people like commenting on the price and how it's such a good deal. And wow. like, mm-hmm. it's like the best bargain they've ever found. And like, clearly, like, you don't think that when you go to an Amazon product that the reviews are going to be fake, but how could they stop them? I also don't them, trust right? any of them, though. But I mean, that happened on Steam recently where a company made employees give positive reviews for their games and Steam found out, Valve found out and took their games off of Steam. It's like, oh, this is, that's actually quite um, prevalent in mobile. Interesting. Where there's, um, there's been several developers who've been caught doing that. It's crazy. Yeah. There are services out there. I mean, like you can buy fake likes on Twitter or you can actually drive traffic, right? To specific web pages. Same thing for reviews. It's a thing that you can pay for and it's relatively cheap too. I think you can even pay for YouTube views. It's like Mm -hmm. a lot of that stuff is, it's, it's so interesting in the market for it. There was, um, don't remember what the name of the site was, but someone managed to get like data of all these email addresses of people who had bought uh, Twitter followers. And it was like this huge list of like popular politicians and celebrities and like sports stars and all of these people that it's like, what do you benefit from this? Like, why would you do this? They do it because somebody at an ad agency sees 500,000 views on a video and they don't care if somebody's actually watching it. It's a number on a slide in their PowerPoint presentation, you know, and yeah. that's really all that it matters to them. That's why people buy followers on Instagram or buy followers on Twitter. And, and that's why the social media platforms are cracking down on ad it. Ad deals, it kind of makes sense. Like, like, you know, I've never done any sponsored thing. So I've always just been like, I don't get it because it's, it's usually really easy to tell. Like if someone has fake likes or fake followers, you're like, well, your engagement doesn't add up with your following. Yes. So obviously that's not real. And right. It's I somebody think it, who like, has like 2 million you. followers and their, their tweets get like 300 likes. Yeah. They're like, wait a minute. This doesn't add up. Yeah. It's really, yeah, it's, it's really, really weird. We are starting to see a shift now where this like bubble of influencer marketing is about to burst because ultimately the return on investment isn't there for people who are spending thousands or tens of thousands of dollars on these influencer ads. Mm. 
So like, hopefully, you know, they got the getting while it was good because it's about to end because the metrics for monitoring all of this is becoming so much more sophisticated that you can't really hide behind these false numbers or bots and like the um, the people who own the platforms are getting much more savvy to totally all of the scams that are in place. The only thing that I've ever done that was like technically in that wheelhouse was that I got this um, Fallout 3 Brotherhood of Steel uh, helmet made and it was like made out of fiberglass and it's like one of the coolest things that I own and I love it so much and the guy was like yeah well if you leave this like link in the description that has like this code then you can get it, it we can add it up if there are enough sales and you can get five five percent off per sale and you could eventually get the full armor set for free if it pays itself off and I was like hell what? yeah like it never paid off it was like thousands no. of dollars <laughs> that link is still there like it's not gonna ever be paid <laughs> off then I was like this sounds incredible but I think that's a good way to do it because it means that it, it, it's directly related to the click-through rate so it's like it has to be related to that and I think that's what Loot Crate does they do things with like influences it's like oh well if you sign up via my subscription link then I get this cut back yeah. from that yeah it's like affiliate marketing yeah is, is and that makes sense to me yeah. yeah that makes more sense than just like hey let me pay you all this money and then you like you'll you'll just buy all the likes and the followers and, and uh, who knows like it's it's fascinating it really is well, it's the same it, thing has happened with the the whole russian bot thing now it's like all of our social media is kind of being just faked it's like it's crazy Russian yeah. bots. I did not expect yeah. the conversation to to turn in this direction. Yeah, how did we? Yeah, it I would. It went to a weird place. It <laughs> did. Sorry about that. A good place. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you um, if you have some favorite games or favorite genres that you like to play in your spare time when you're not playing something for work. I pretty much always uh, play new releases. Like constantly play new releases, probably out of a sense of guilt and that I really want to be up to date on everything. For what? I get it, 100%. Right, but at the same time, I almost like every genre of game. Um, my favorite game is Deadly Premonition. You ever played that? Nice! Played that? Oh my god. I have a tattoo. Yeah! <gasps> Wait. It's like, my favorite game by... I need to make sure that this is the same game, but I'm pretty That's sure amazing. this is what Brett Vig I never reviewed. finished that game, but what I did play of it, I loved it. It no, was really charming. And I'm meaning to get back to it, because I loved it. It's like, that reminded me of old horror games of days of old, right? Like, yeah. Ugh. And it's like, yeah. it's like Twin Peaks, the video game. Um, it's very <laughs> weird and very bad, and I don't recommend it to oh, yeah. anyone, but it's my favorite game. People either Didn't love it or hate it. Did they just come out with a board game? Yeah. Like that? Yeah, yeah, they did. Okay. Yeah, I don't think they'll make a second one, which sucks, but that's my favorite game. Um, yeah, I, I, I just love that, because I was there when Brudvig was reviewing it. He fucking hated that game. People <laughs> either give it like a 2 out of 10 or a 10 out of 10. I think it's like one of Jim Sterling's only 10 out of 10 review scores. Like I think uh, IGN Australia gave it a stupidly high score and then the U S gave it a really low score. Like it's all over the place, depending on how you get attached to it. But it's just like, I love it so much, but uh, other favorite games that have to be like, I love fallout three. I grew up playing N64 and PS2. So there's like all of the classics on those. I obviously adore Um, vice city, baby. Vice city's a really good game. So good. Yeah. I think I prefer San Andreas, but both very good games. Um, Never got into that one. I don't know why. Really? That's interesting. Yeah. I think I just loved the 80s vibe of Grand Theft Auto Vice City. Totally. Like, it's like all Miami Vice all the time. Yeah. I think I like the map size and, and the, uh, like, I was going to say clan wars, the gang war stuff in, in San Andreas is like what really got me hooked mm-hmm. to it. Um, I love the Arkham series a whole lot. Uh, really so have a soft spot for Guild Wars 2. Uh, <gasps> Dragon's Dogma. <gasps> uh, I'm sorry. What? That's Steimer's what? one of Steimer's like, bays. Like Guild Wars? I love Guild Specifically I too, though. Guild like Wars. I like the first one too. Yeah, yeah. But Guild Wars two, I think, is just like an incredible. I game. have 1,100 hours in Guild Wars two. That's crazy. <laughs> you should play. <laughs> Nobody will play. With I haven't me. played it in several years, but it's like a game. I haven't that played I just it in a long time either. Wait, you just played <laughs> the new expansion, didn't you? I didn't get it. Wait, you Girl, did? I don't have time. <laughs> you, have time. you have you have over a thousand hours. <laughs> That was when it launched. Yeah. I was really like I the liked first year I played that all the time. Yeah. What are some of your favorite horror games? Uh, Silent Hill 2, which is like classic, obviously. Um, Deadly Premonition kind of counts as a horror game. I really yeah, like the Evil yeah. Within 2, speaking of things that are recent. Yeah, that was a, a surprise lot. for me. I didn't anticipate liking that game as much as I did. Britt and I started playing it as part of Lights Off, the, mm-hmm. the horror show that I was talking about earlier. And I got 
almost to the end. I never actually finished that game. Maybe I should go back and finish that. I didn't either. It, it gets really long towards the end, though. But, like, what I did play that I absolutely loved, and I liked it a lot more than the first one. I don't... I think the, the level design in the first one I didn't like so much, but uh, PT is also one of my favorite games. Mm. Like, huge debates on whether that's actually a game or not, but I absolutely adore it's that. It's a game. Um, I, I got pretty hard into Slender, like, the original version of Slender. <laughs> That I just oh, replayed These two a lot. played Slender and it was hysterical. I was oh, inside so the good. house working on stuff and they were in the studio and the screams it's scary, that came dude. from the studio. I thought somebody was dying. You got to go into that Where? bathroom complex thing first or you just screwed. That's like that game is that game is intense. But I played it having just like seen things about it on the Internet and didn't know what it was. I had no idea what the concept was because you could just download it. It was a tiny file and played it and didn't know. And then, you know, saw him in the distance was like, don't know nope. what that is. I uh, guess I just keep walking. And then, you know, the static starts and I was like, something bad is happening. Yep. But I had no idea what it was. It was just it was so much fun. I love that game a, a whole lot. Uh -huh. I think about the heart. I like Resident Evil series is obviously amazing. I really oh. liked Seven, and I still think about Seven a lot. Um, Seven's great. Didn't like the end, but the first two thirds of that game I adore. Like, did that. you play the DLC? Not a hero, and I've played the other one. some of the DLC. Um, I don't remember the name, but the one where you have to uh, break out of the room and you have to put all the things back in order. I didn't oh, play. Yeah, is is not a hero the mom. the procedurally generated one? There's not one of. It Which is one, so. So, not a hero is the one with Chris Redfield, and that's the gotcha. one that that's takes, the most recent one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the one that takes place like after um, the end of Resident Evil Seven. And then there's uh, End of Zoe, which also takes place after Resident Evil Seven. I mean, it doesn't make the ending necessarily any better because I agree with you. But it was, the ending of RE Seven was very typical Resident Evil fashion. Um, but yeah, you should play them. I, I should. Mean, just, if, you, if, if you're a Resident Evil lore nut like I am, you'll appreciate it. I just really liked all the different game modes they came out with. Like, I don't know that it was procedurally generated, but the the one that's, like, about Lucas, and you have to, I think it's, like, collect a certain amount of things in a certain amount of time, and, like, you, you're trying to get supplies out of boxes, but some of them will explode on you, and you have to, like, listen to them really carefully to, like, hear them ticking, and, like, it just had all of these really interesting things that it did. Like, even the, the birthday cake tape, like, that kind of stuff was, ah, that oh, game yeah. was really good. I liked it a lot. It just uh, yeah, it was like the last two hours got really repetitive and just like here's every enemy you faced up until this point. Let's do it. Oh, you like that part with the boat? Do it again. He's like, oh, but I didn't like it the first time. I hate that. <laughs> Come on, man. I hate that in games. Yeah, so that's like, true. Would you like to fight everything you've already fought? I'm like, no, no, I really would not. <laughs> no, I actually wouldn't. Especially yeah, in Resident Evil, where you have like two different enemy types. It's like anyway. Forever, ever. I feel like you and I could talk about this for a while, Alana. But yeah. I, I see the eyes glazing. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just, I, I know that we're getting towards the end of the show. And um, I wanted to, um, I know we never actually said the name of your podcast in this segment, but uh, Red Lips Orange Car is, is the name if you guys want to subscribe to it on podcast services to check out all of the stories. Um, and you also have a Patreon. What kind of content can people find there? I make all kinds of stuff i'll do uh like most recently i got a wisdom tooth out and then saw black panther that night so i was high as hell so i did a Whoa. like very high on painkillers <laughs> review of black panther i get really nice. weird on there um i sometimes like upload music mixes i'll sometimes do like just at anything that i want to that's creative is what i put up there i do a lot of cosplay stuff on there um and i've been recently like i just told you guys earlier i've been working on a siri cosplay and i've like started sharing glimpses of that there so yeah i put a lot of my creative outlets that i don't want to like clutter my other feeds with go up on patreon but i also do a lot of blog posts and like just here's my opinion on this thing let's talk about it it's like a lot of hanging out with people so um that was an extension of my youtube channel which i'm also still uploading to every single week also a weird assortment of stuff but yeah, Patreon's been, like, one of the most fun things I think I've ever done in, in terms of a community that just, like, is, like, this is cool, and you can get really weird, and it's a lot of fun, and I'm still allowed yeah. to get drunk on there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> They're, like, stop getting drunk on camera publicly, okay? And I was, like, Patreon. <laughs> Patreon. Listen, yeah. if anybody has been to too. our monthly happy hour Q&As, all of our patrons are invited every month. Like, it gets weird there as well, and then it gets even more off the rails in the after yeah. hours segment. I've done, like, a couple where I've just had, like, guy friends do my makeup while drunk and just, like, weird stuff like that. <laughs> it's like it's just like a ton of fun it's amazing like, let's do it. let's yeah do it. so what is the uh what is the address for that if people want to go check it out it's just i wish that my handle was easier to spell it's patreon.com slash charlanazad which is my name in the middle of charizard which is c-h-a-r-a-l-a-n-a-h-z-a-r-d h h 
<laughs> no, I love it because my my best friend is from Sydney, so she oh, says, cool. yeah, she says H as well. Yeah. So I just she was just um, I took her to the Dice Awards actually. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't think I got the chance to introduce you guys, but um, it was interesting having see her reaction to everything that we do on an ongoing basis. Um, and Vegas. Yeah. Vegas is crazy. Well, it's one of her favorite places on earth. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Wow. She, so we, so she lives in Sydney, as I mentioned, and it was her birthday and it was my turn to go visit her because we have been rotating, but generally she comes to the U S instead of me coming to Sydney, just cause my, like you, my travel schedule is so crazy. It's hard for me to get enough chunk of a time to go there. And so we were going to meet in Hawaii, which is why I was not on the podcast, which is why it was the Britain Steimer show. Oh, but doing it in Hawaii is the best. Like back when I was on TV money, it was like I still <laughs> lived in the U.S. and I would fly <laughs> through Hawaii and then I would stay there for two days and then fly to Australia because it, it bridges the time zone. Right. But also just lets you stay on a cool island for two days, like in between yeah. flying home. And it, it like shortens the flight by a lot too it's like five hours and then nine hours rather than doing like a whole 15 it's like a way better way to do it if, if you can yeah so we decided to meet there so we spent uh, a couple of days there for her birthday and then i said i had to fly directly from hawaii to vegas she was like vegas you're going to las vegas <laughs> and i was like well i'm going for a conference i'm giving a round table there's an award show so generally when we're at these conferences we don't have time to see anybody or anything outside of the convention center but i was like hey if you want to come you know i'm sure you can find something to keep yourself busy in vegas um and so she did so one she of the coolest in. things i've ever done was uh, you know whenever i go home i don't have a ton of time to see all of my family members and uh i flew my dad and my sister to pax oz with me and i was cosplaying as like 90s lara croft my sister dressed up as modern lara croft and then my dad dressed up as indiana jones so we like went to pax as like a little group of of tomb raiders basically and it was the coolest thing and they had so much fun and like they came to all my panels about things that they had never heard of i'm just like man i'm learning so much and it was such a cool thing and then you know when i had downtime we'd go to like the board games area and just play board games and it was it was awesome i think like even introducing people who aren't used to nerd community stuff to what it's like they're like oh this is so much better than I thought it would be in my head. In my head, I thought it would be like a bunch of sweaty people in a room just sitting there silently. Like, no, <laughs> that's not <laughs> what it is. Sometimes that's what it is. But sometimes, sometimes, yeah. sometimes, sometimes that happens. Yeah. Well, this has been awesome. Um, ladies, do you have any parting questions before we wrap up? Anything? No? What's the biggest thing you missed from Australia? Sausage rolls. Wait, what's that? Uh, a sausage roll is like a <laughs> my family is what I actually meant to say. But <laughs> aside from my family, uh, a sausage roll is like a a kind of like a, I think that they might be called like pigs in a blanket is like a similar thing here. Ooh, yep, that's mm-hmm. good. So it's like a but it's not like a real sausage. It's like meat that's kind of like mushed up and then pastry on the outside. So like you bite into it, it's all this like crispy pastry, and then on the inside it's like meat, but it, it's just like really melty. And I just oh, I love them so much. Also Ooh. meat pies. It's like anytime I go home, I like Australian coffee, Australian food, and even the hash browns in Australia are like the kind, they're all like homemade, but they're the kind of hash browns you get from McDonald's. Whereas the first time that I ordered a hash brown here and I got shredded potato, I was like, what? Oh, <laughs> what you're is like, this? You know, like the, the, like the cake with like the yes. mashed potato inside. Yes. So it's like mm. a giant French fry, essentially. Kind of, yeah. yeah. I'm hungry. <laughs> Sounds real good. <laughs> Um, but don't order a lemonade because you'll get something that you were not expecting. You What's think that? if you order a lemonade, you're getting, you know, a sugary lemon beverage that is yellow in color. But no, in Australia, it's Sprite. Oh, yeah, it is just Sprite. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh okay. I actually don't think Good I've ever know. had lemonade, like actual lemonade. I think I've only ever had Sprite. You're missing out. It's pretty delicious. Lemonade's is it, delicious. Actual is it not lemonade. sour? Yes, but that's what's good. It depends what's good. on how much sugar you put into it. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. It's like you can make your sour. own level of sour. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. So now I want sausage rolls. Glad we figured Now that we out. all want sausage rolls. So we'll try to figure and out lemonade. where we can get some. Lemonade. <laughs> get some. You guys should totally try to go to Pax Oz at some point if you can. It's my favorite oh, convention in the I entire world. I definitely want to. Um, I've heard nothing but good things about Melbourne. Beautiful. I've actually never been. I've only been up the Gold Coast but besides Sydney. I mm-hmm. have never gone south. Oh, cool. So, but well, I, I live, lived, lived? 
very close to the Gold Coast, like an hour away in Brisbane, which is the third large, largest city. But um, I won three hundred dollars gambling at a casino in Brisbane. There's only one casino, the Crown Casino. That's that's that place is okay. <laughs> it's fine. <laughs> I was like twenty one. <laughs> I was very young, and we were like, I want to go. Actually, it might be the Treasury. I think the Crown might be the one in the Gold Coast, but. Yeah, I went there when I when I turned 18 because I was like, oh, I can finally go to a casino. And then I was like, oh, this yep. is not good. <laughs> That's usually the casinos you go to when you're 18 because yeah. you can't afford the other ones. You can't afford the nice no. ones. Yeah. You're absolutely right. like, where Melbourne the, is beautiful. Where are the $2 blackjack tables? That's, that's, <laughs> yep. that's I, I don't mean. know how to play. <laughs> <laughs> exactly well this has been awesome thank you so much thank for you. for coming by and just so you guys one more time charlotte nazard we'll put it in the show notes <laughs> Char, 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 champagne. Yeah. Uh, we'll put it in the show notes so if you're driving or if you're watching and you're like wait what did they say uh you can just click on the link and uh red lips orange car is the podcast and of mm-hmm. course you can see her at ign.com on a variety of shows and podcasts all kinds of content that they have going on there. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at PAX East, which is in just a couple of weeks. Um, and thank you guys for, for tuning in this week. Don't forget you can follow us on Twitter at what's good underscore games. You can support us on Patreon at patreon.com slash what's good games. We have some fun merch. If you guys haven't checked it out yet, we've got three new designs. We've got the goodbye forever. We've got the hippo. We've got the nerdy for narrative, which is one of my favorites. Mm-hmm. We've got the seal bando and other cool stuff. And that's teespring.com slash stores slash what's good games. And um, we'll be back next week with uh, lots more video game talk until then. Have a great weekend and we'll see you guys next time. Bye. Oh, 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 oh,